everyone. It's the 29th of October. I'm going to do this uh, Q&A video today, so there's quite a few questions. Uh, there's some in the last couple of videos, really. I thought I'll link them into this um, Q&A, and I've had a couple of private messages as well on my Facebook and obviously email. Um, so I thought I'll uh, compile them all together and answer as much of them as I can in this video, which is pretty much all of them, I think. I think I've got all of them. Um, I was going to print them all out, but printers out of ink so I've uh, I've gone through the comments and I think I've got all the ones and I've I've kind of wrote in note form what the questions are so there's, there's, there's quite a lot uh, on very different things uh, from obviously gardening tortoise keeping fishing and of course music the guitar stuff so uh, there's not going to be something for everyone you know in this video necessarily if it's just gardening but um, obviously these are questions that have been asked by um, my subscribers you know so it's great that uh, some of you have asked, you know, and um, thanks again for following. And obviously, if you want to support the channel, all the links in the description below for that as well. There'll be probably a couple of still shots I'll put on the screen at certain times. Some of the questions want me to show something, so uh, if I've got a still shot, I'll put that in the in the actual video. Along with, if there's any information or the links to anything, they'll all be in the description below as well. So, nothing to do out in the garden really, because it's, uh, it's horrible outside. I've had like wind and rain. So I thought I'll just come out and water this bed because it's uh, not been watered for about a week and a half. So I just think when you're growing stuff in the colder months, it doesn't really need as much water, but it still needs water. So uh, we shall get on, get inside and uh, do these uh, questions. All right, we're back inside now where it's a, bit, a little bit warmer. So I've, I've got the, uh, all the questions wrote down, a couple of pages full. So I'll just quickly read through the questions now and then I'll obviously say them again as I'm answering each one. I might not necessarily do them all in this order. Um, they're not going to be just sort of like gardening, then music, then fishing. That They'll be mixed up, you know, as I go through, I'll probably do them like that. So uh, I've wrote some of the um, my subscribers' names down, but not all of them. So I've actually got um, the uh, Gargle42, Gregory, Christine Banks, uh, Tufty McTavish, Paul Darren, Willow Grove, um, Dave Jones, Eric and Rachel, Stephen, uh, Ian Jackson again, My Ladybug, Wales, AJWGBFX, I think that's a chap in Preston, that. Uh, another one from Paul Aaron. So there's, there's, a, there's a few on here that have asked, you know, um, multiple questions, which is fine, you know, I don't mind. And obviously there'll probably be some questions uh, in the comments to this video, um, which I'll answer in another video if need be. <coughs> if you want to know anything more in any more detail, I'll try and cover as much as I can in this video anyway. So it's going to be probably quite a long one because some of these are quite uh, big questions that involve a bit more of a descriptive sort of, um, which I will do, you know, if I, can, if I can kind of describe it in a practical form, I will do. So we'll start off. Um, <coughs> do I overwinter peppers? Um, problems regarding celery, growing it. Um, what makes holes in the peppers? Um, how did I get into gardening? Um, another question with someone who's struggling with peppers. Uh, well, gig dates, so that's obviously my band, any gigs I've got. So I'll, there'll be a screenshot at some point for this video with uh, gig dates for the remainder of this year and uh, what I've got booked in so far next year. I'm not doing lots of gigs because obviously, as some of you know, I've got this chronic fatigue. So I have to just, um, and obviously caring for my father as well, which is so everything has to have a bit of a shared space. <coughs> um, right, we've got here now. Um, uh, uh, Ali, um, she said uh, the son's a bass player. Uh, he has a, a hearing issue. Well, some of you might um, know I have hearing issues, so we'll go into that in more depth after. You know, ways I get around that, which you can't really consult the book of uh, hard of hearing musicians, really. Um, so you just have to work what you got. Um, and we've got uh, quite a few questions on Kane. Um, how hungry is he most of the time? Does he snack? Uh, does he like being by himself? Um, are they solitary animals? Does he like his pond? Um, how, f how full of my freezers? Um, did my family have a go-to recipe? Do you have any particular plans for excess produce? Um, do I ever grow squash? Um, someone's put, what do I feed my, my, my peppers? Um, someone's put, what guitar amp and pedals do I use? So obviously that's a more music-based one, so I'll be showing you that. Um, 
fish, you know, uh, what favourite species are, you know, what sort of fishing I do. Um, does cane hibernate? Uh, sometimes have problems with basil. Um, then we've got uh, someone obviously uh, regarding sweet peas. And we've got uh, things about my potato bed and what, I've, what I think towards um, using nematodes for slugs or other garden pests. Um, another one regarding fishing. Um, do I use a mixer or do I use a, a pub in-house sound system? So that'll be you know, quite a descriptive one on what I actually use in a live situation. Um, but I do record things as well, which is kind of similar setup. Um, have I ever worked as a cook? Um, how big is my allotment site? Uh, something about leopards, leopard slugs eating worms. Um, another one about slugs regarding nematodes and pellets. And what guitars do I use and own? So um, there'll be. Uh, I'll probably do a, a bit of a picture or um, a bit of a brief description of each of the guitars I have, um, which have been bought over nearly 30 years. So um, there's quite a bit to go at, so like I said, it's going to be quite a long video, so we shall uh, get cracking. Um, so it's going to be filmed in multiple places around the house, because that's where things are. Because the setup here is obviously me, my partner and my father. You know, it's my father's house, so we, uh, we have our area that we sort of stay in. What I call servants' quarters for a little bit of a laugh, really. But because um, obviously some of some of you know my partner does art, so she has a little room that she does her art in as well. Um, so I'll probably put a link for her website because she's been doing a website as well. I'll probably put a link for that in the description below um, in case you, any of you want some art doing. Um, so uh, we shall crack on with this. I'll get myself a brew and uh, well, not. Yeah, I've got some tea bags in, so uh, we'll get on with that. I'll uh, give myself a brew and we shall get cracking to him. Right, so upstairs, so this is uh, my room, or mine and my partner's sort of sleeping area, and my music, stroke guitar, working area. And obviously it's where I do all my editing for my videos as well, because it's all my computers in here and my laptop, and, which none of them are working that great, to be honest. They're all getting a bit old now, so I have to go through which one's working or uh, one works better for music stuff than the videos. So we'll go through these uh, questions now. So if you hear any background noise, that is Kane, because Kane is in here. Kane shares the room with me as well. So it's uh, he's uh, banging about in his box at the moment, which we'll uh, have a look at this after. And I will obviously have a look at Kane. Uh, I would have him out, but you know, there's no uh, sunshine. So for those who don't know, Kane is my um, tortoise. So I've had him for well, 16 years, just over 16 years now. So he's got uh, plenty of years left. So we'll uh, We'll discuss Kane with the uh, with the questions. So um, questions. Um, the very first question is gig dates. So I will put a still shot on the screen anytime now, and those will be the gig dates that I'm uh, performing live with the band The Waiting, which is the band I'm in. For any of you that are fairly local that want to come, feel free to come. You know, it's great to have their support. You know, we don't do many gigs a year anyway, so we kind of limit to sort of anything between fifteen and twenty. So uh, this year has been fairly busy, you know, we've probably done um, about 17 gigs. We've got three left this year and I've got 11 booked in for next year so far. So uh, there'll be links to the band's Facebook page. So if you want to follow that, that's fine. All the gig dates will be updated on there, either by me or my partner or one of the other guys in the band. We're just basically a four piece band. So um, there's, we do have a YouTube channel, but um, we tend to not target that too much. We just, anything we do, we pop on there. Um, but sometimes I put some of the band stuff on my channel as well because, you know, some people uh, are kind of interested in it. You know, not as many as obviously the garden because it's predominantly a gardening channel. You know, it's just um, there's certain things that I pop in for because people ask because they've, they've got to know me over, what, um, 10 years of being on YouTube. So, um, next question. Do I overwinter peppers? Um, I have tried. Uh, I've succeeded a couple of times. Um, it, it tends to be a case of I, I intend to, but um, getting around to doing it is a different thing. Um, you know, because obviously this year I've done them in the ground, um, but I, I've got an idea what to do, hack them right back and um, obviously put them somewhere frost free, back up on the drain, but don't let them dry right out. And then the, you've got like a good root ball and a plant. You kind of split it down to pretty much its first Y more or less, and then um, it'll sprout off. Um, next year, um, it's, I'd probably say success rate for me when I've done it in the past has been probably 
about 30-40%, uh, more so with things like um, the chilies, you know, they seem to do okay. You can bring them in on the windowsill over the, over the winter months. It uh, doesn't really particularly have to be um, a north, uh, south facing or anything like that, or west facing. You can, it's just basically about keeping the plant alive and you can keep pruning back any growth and it'll keep putting it out, but it might be a bit leggy. So just keep, as long as there's some growth on it, keep pruning it back. So, um, but I tend to not um, in, intend on sort of uh, overwintering peppers, but if I get a day where I'm thinking like, I could do something to do today, whether or not, and, It'll catch me eye and I'll get on with it, but a lot of the time it's kind of the frost has come and nailed the plants, you know, because um, obviously there's things still going on in the garden and uh, it's a fairly busy life, you know, that I do have um, because I've got to condense what I can now manage with the health conditions into a shorter time limit, you know, um, I don't get a lot of free time where I can do anything. So Kane's had a bit of a clank about because he knows I'm in here and he'll be after food, not really after anything else. He gets a bit frustrated. So uh, I'll say there's been plenty of information on cane after. Um, celery growing wasn't great for um, someone this year. Um, it is a tricky one to grow, not actually to grow, but to get it so it's not springy, because it is a bog plant. So um, what can I sort of, I mean, because I'm not a specialist in sort of celery or peppers at all, you know, I just, I'd probably say um, add more organic matter to the soil that is kind of more you're looking for something that retains water but doesn't compact if that makes sense and regular watering possibly a drip irrigation would help massively because celery just doesn't like to go dry um, like I say it's a bog plant and if it goes dry then it ends up quite stringy it doesn't bother me because I tend to use it in, in sauces so it's chopped fine and it's cooked but if you're having it in salads or raw you really need to pay attention to the watering uh, plenty of organic matter, um, you can mulch as well, if you want, you can mulch grass stuff because they do like it, they are quite nitrogen hungry. Um, but uh, yeah, water is 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 a, a big contributing factor to being successful with celery. Um, timing as well, you know, because you can sow it quite early, it does take a while to grow. You can do bl the blanche variety or the self blanche, a lot tend to go for the self blanche because it's a lot cleaner, you know, um, you do the... Um, the blanching way, the old traditional way, was you'd dig a, a trench, a bit like you do for potatoes. You plant your celery in the bottom of that, and as it grows, you'd earth up around it. Um, but the thing is, obviously, you get a lot of mud down the stem. Other ways you can do it, I've done it in the past, but I've wrapped things around the stem and tied it to, to kind of block the light from the stalks. And so there's just a little bit of foliage poking out the top. Uh, that's okay, but slugs do like to go down, and slugs is uh, a nightmare for any gardener, really. There's no escaping 100%, but there are ways, which we'll discuss, um, that you can try to, to uh, sort of, I won't say live in harmony with them, but try and uh, get a better result, you know, rather than, because uh, it is disheartening, you lose a lot, you know, and sometimes it is down to human error uh, or human sort of negligence, you know, because it doesn't take long and you think it'll be all right for a day or two and um, slugs can do a lot of damage in a day or two, as can a lot of other garden pests. Uh, what else we've got here? What makes holes in my peppers? I can't quite remember the name of it, um, but it's I think it's a moth or some sort of beetle. I know earwigs like to go inside peppers, but I don't think they actually make a hole in them, but uh, obviously slugs will um, and snails will. I find more slugs than anything, to be honest, than snails, um, but it's mainly caterpillars. I'm not sure it's like a hornworm or something like that it's called, but I do have a picture because I thought this question would come up and I took a picture. Probably, um, it was one of clearing the foliage off. So it was quite a small one, um, but they do get quite big. They are really hard to spot as well because um, they lay so still, uh, especially if it's the green ones. Um, they, they lay perfectly on the vein and they, they just blend in that well. You, you do need to sort of like get your plant and sort of try and analyse and look at every every stalk and leaf, which can take a while, you know, if you've got a lot on the go. And obviously if they're in the ground, you can't really manoeuvre. So it's, um, I'd probably say with uh, a good sort of pruning of lower foliage, good airflow um, and access for predators to get in, which is tricky when you're trying to protect a crop. 
you protect it from pests, but are you also shutting the predator out? So it's a fine line of do you want to leave it exposed to more predators or make it easier for predators to um, get in? You know, or obviously if you close that off, you probably have less pests. It's a fine balance. You know, it just depends what predators and pests are in your particular garden and what you can attract in with companion planting. I don't really, I'm not a big thing with companion planting because I don't tend to have the room as much, you know, and for me it's, uh, if it's anything I've got to maintain that I can't really eat. Um, I'm more for like, oh, it's a lot of effort, but a little reward, you know, um, because the, the garden and the allotment for me is 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 a, a living food larder. That's how I look at it. You know, you can spend hours mowing and deadheading plants and things like that. And you're thinking, well, in place of that flower, I could actually grow a meal. So that's that, that's my concept. It's not every it's not everyone's sort of personal opinion, but that's my personal opinion is like, you know, there's a spare bit of ground there. I can shove something in there. You know, there's a square foot there. I've put four or six garlic in there, you know. It's, uh, you know, and in, in, if I grew flowers, you know, I'd probably think, well, I can tuck some garlic in between because they'll just grow the green foliage and it can, can look nice in beds, same as leeks. You know, and then when your flowers have died back, you think, oh, well, I'll get my garlic out now. Spring onions, little bunches of spring onions and chives. You, you can mix and match, you know. So obviously, edible flowers like nasturtiums and marigolds and all that sort of thing, they're all good for adding colour to the dish. You know, um, but regarding um, yeah, the holes in the peppers, I'll put a st another still shot up of, or, or a few up of what I've um, actually taken a picture of because um, I found one in the pepper and I've seen them before doing it. You tend to see them more actually in the night. They are hard to see in the day. I'm not sure if they go down in the compost or something at night, but they, they, I, I tend to see them more, you know, at night time in the hours of dark and you go out there. Cause I do, I go out in the garden, head torch on, I must look a right idiot, you know, it's not like one, two o'clock in the morning, if I wake up, I'm thinking, oh, go and get a brew and I'll put my hat on my head torch on, I'm walking out the garden like a lighthouse, you know, but um, it's, it's surprising what pests you do spot, and that's how I came across the flatworms, you know, just doing that. And obviously there's different pests, um, predominantly slugs, you, you can have a big impact on your slug problem if you go out in the dark which we'll discuss later on. Next question, how did I get into gardening? Um, was it down to my mum's sweet peas? Um, no, I started gardening. Um, my first introduction to gardening was as a child, you know, because I'm originally from London, um, near Slough. That's where I, I was born in a, a village called Denham Village originally. And I think it was 1982 or 81. Um, I'd have been about... Yeah, 82, I'd have been five. So, um, just coming up six. So we moved up um, to Blackpool, well, Portland File, which is just outside Blackpool, because we have, you know, um, my, my nan and aunts and that, they were all living up here, because my dad is originally from down south. So uh, we came up here and um, it was like, a, in them days, I think it was like a council swap. Someone moved up here you know, uh, when we moved up here, they moved down there, they've done like that, you know, until my mum and dad could afford to buy the house, you know, because we were quite a very poor family, you know, so uh, we didn't have much at all. But, um, you know, there was me, my mum and dad and my two sisters. So um, and when we came, the garden was like, you know, three foot high in grass, you know, and a bit overgrown, full of buying weed. So my dad, back then, obviously in his younger years, he'd have been like, what? 35, something like that. Cleared it all, put some like crazy paving down, because crazy paving was a bit of an in thing then, you know, so you, you could find some broken flags in highways department and stuff, and uh, my dad used to bring a bucket wheelbarrow, because none of us drove, you know, mum and dad didn't have a car or anything, anything. And then he'd flag little areas, and then but the bulk of the garden all the way to the back was dug over. You know, there was a lot of rubble and stuff which was buried um, to help drain the garden. and. Um, didn't turf it. We had a little tiny grass area, but it was predominantly both sides all the way down. It was just like two big beds. And I, 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 it's only certain memories. I remember planting potatoes with my dad. And um, I always remember these like really big tall green stems with white flowers on, which I know now are onions that have gone to seed. And there'd be like loads of radish, the, um, maras. Uh, but there was a lot of veg I didn't like. You know, I think. Um, it was more of a, 
I don't think it was used in a, in a real functional way because there was a lot of stuff that wasn't harvested. Spuds, yeah, you know, but that went on for probably four or five years. You know, so it's only a memory. So what actually um, got me into gardening was um, the garden sort of deteriorated over the years. And then I was looking out the window one day because I had a couple of dogs at the time. I thought, oh, what a mess, I need to sort some out of that. So I went out in March, I think it was something like 95, 94, 95, and I thought, right, I'm going to sort this garden out. Because um, I was doing an apprenticeship at the time, I think, and which was spraying cars, because that was my first trade when I left school, was I, was, I became a car sprayer and panel beater before I became a plumbing and heating engineer. So I, um, I cleared all the garden, again, because it had everyone, you know, mattresses and all sorts of junk, probably my fault as well, you know, things, you know, mopeds that we used to mess about on they were in the ground and all sorts of rusted and all sorts so it was a bit of a junkyard so i buried what i could as you do and then um we sort of saved up a little bit and uh, we got some little flags and we turfed we could only get so far and then we run out of money so there's an area at the bottom which kind of remained like that for a few more months and then i thought right I'm going to um, dig that. So I dug it over and I just started with things like, you know, potatoes, lettuce, um, onions and stuff like that, you know, because there was no internet back then, so, you know, nothing like that. You just scratch your head, you know, it was kind of like ask someone who you knew. And there wasn't really anyone in my family that was from a gardening background. My granddad used to do tomatoes because he had an old greenhouse made of window frames, you know, but um, I didn't see my granddad that much because she used to always be working all the time on the rail. Um, and it was kind of like just trial and error. Um, and obviously that's expanded over the years, you know, we're doing that and thinking, oh, I can, what can I grow there and harvesting it and not really, not really been brought up on a diet of fresh food, you know, which uh, we weren't, we were kind of like chip pan full of lard and, um, some cheap cuts of meat here and there, you know, sliced meat and corned beef and beans and sausages and stuff like that so it's quite basic um, foods you know and um, apart from a roast which was a rare occasion you know so, so I could grow some things like cabbage um, and things like that which we used in the roast and then um, it was probably years later I got a bit more um, I, I, I sort of switched it to be more like right I need to make this work for me now and that that's how I sort of developed, you know, trying different things and kind of went down a bit like the square foot garden area, you know, and did things like in grids rather than the conventional big long beds. Because back then everyone used to grow things in big long rows, you know, you know, like, you know, a 20 or 30 foot row of something and it'd be like that, which was okay. But they're hard to protect from pests and stuff. You know, the nets and everything came later because you do get fed up of losing crops. And um, obviously then when, you know, um, tortoise came along and one of my ex-partners had a tortoise. It, it became, it was imperative to grow things because they're, they're, they're not the cheapest thing, not the dearest thing to, to keep, but um, when you've got to produce, you know, it's fair enough, I mean, when they're, when they're tiny hatchling, they're small, but that hatchling soon grows and so does its diet. So that's predominantly how I got into gardening. It was kind of like, I'd, I'd seen a bit of it as a child, but I took it upon myself and I just basically went out there with a spade and thought, how do I do this? And just did it and found out for myself, which I, I tend to find I do better in it, is, is self-taught. Don't try and copy, but do things. Don't be frightened of changing or trying different things. And if you, you can sit there pondering and thinking about things and it might completely fail, but it might be the ultimate key to success with a particular crop. And um, that has worked for me in the past with a lot of things where you sort of have a, you know, a light bulb moment. You think, why, why have I not done this before? You know, and that's what you do. And that's, that's basically my introduction to gardening and how I do it now. So it's, it's pretty much self-taught. And obviously, as you watch me, I watch YouTube gardens when I got the internet. I'm probably uh, watching YouTube gardens from about 2010. I think I sort of got my introdu introduction to the internet about 2010. I was never a tech whiz or anything like that, um, but that's that's how that's answered that question. Um, someone else has struggled with peppers. Um, 
I always have struggled with peppers, you know, on various years, but I think with um, this year has been a success because I've, I always struggled. So I thought I need to try and find a way to make this work. And like I say, it's, it's ideas. Don't be frightened of it. Trying three different ways of, you know, do three pepper plants, throw them in, grow them in three different ways. And it might work. It doesn't matter work every year. You know, it might be an element of um, mother nature, which that is the thing with gardening. You, there is an element you have no control over. That is the weather. Everything else you've got a bit of a control on, but the weather, no control. You know, you could, if every day was the same every year, you know, if you could, if the weather today was the same next year on the same day, it'd be great, but it doesn't work that way. You know, really won't work if you've got a complete wet year, because you'd probably say, oh, I'm not doing any gardening. Because it's no fun being out there in the, in the rain at all in the cold, but uh, the cold, Years of time to get the ground ready, you know, because just because you're cold, the ground's cold, the, the bugs are cold, but they've got to live there and you make it a bit more of a livable environment and that's how you, you sort of nurture the soil on. So don't be frightened of uh, getting well wrapped up, plenty of jackets, woolly gloves on and woolly out and whatnot, you know, and just spend a few hours just thinking, right, what can I throw on that ground to feed that? Because you're abandoning it through the winter, so you need to sort of like, right, here's some food. Um, that's them. Um, they've got something to tide them over and multiply because when that sun pips up again uh, in the spring and it gets that temperature, look, that temperature spike, it all comes alive and there's more of them there because they've, they've had a healthy survival rate through the winter. Uh, you know, because obviously the elements will kill certain things, preferably soil borne pests, but obviously it attacks both good and bad as anything. So um, I'd say, yeah, if you're struggling with peppers, um try different things i used to find compost was quite an issue they do like quite a coarse chunky compost and not so much a fine soil based one um but also humidity is important which i think i've kind of had a light bulb moment on this year on, on some ideas with that and that's why i've had a great year for peppers you know this year I, it's probably you know gone from being in my usual worst to probably one of my best you know good because I had an idea, it just started with an idea. I was thinking like, how can I do this? And I tried it, and has it paid off? 100% has paid off. I've never, never in my gardening years at all have I had an abundance of peppers like I've had in the freezers. You know, I think I've got um, nearly 14 bags of sliced chopped peppers. You know, and it's only from like a little 12 foot row. You know, well, I think there's nine plants, nine, nine or 10 plants and like that. So they've done all right, you know, and obviously my chilies and that, they're still in parts, but it would work with chilies. So that's that one. Um, someone's having a problem with, uh, so, oh, uh, bass player. Uh, Ali, I think she's from Canada, Ali. So I know she's one of her uh, subscribers and she's regularly donated to the channel as well. So big thank you to that. Uh, as Sonny's a bass player and has uh, hearing issues, tinnitus. A tinnitus is quite a common thing, you know, the ringing in the ear. Um, some misconceptions about what it is. You know, it is kind of a hearing damage thing, but it's also, uh, I tend to find, because it can just come on and go, it's as if your brain is ringing out a pitch that it doesn't understand. And now if you can kind of match that pitch externally, so if you go to an instrument or find something that match that note, you know, match it perfectly, your brains go, all oh, right, and it'll switch it off sometimes. But some people have this hum, it's the lower ones are harder, the high pitch whistle. I have it now, you know, because I have hearing problems. Um, because when I was about 12 years old, it's really painful earache, um, you know, and there was blood on the pillow and everything like that. And um, after years of messing about and poking and prodding, and then I got referred to a specialist, because obviously there wasn't quite the technology back then. You know, the ENT, the ear, nose and throat at the hospital. Um, I had this disease in both ears, which was kind of genetic because my me, uh, me mum had problems with hers and so did my sisters with theirs were sorted out at a younger age. I don't know, it's because I was a bit older. Um, my pain threshold shrugged it off a bit, which you should never do, you really. You should never shrug anything off. If, you've, if you're concerned about something, go to the doctors or, or find out what it is. Don't look online so much because you can get frightened, you know, because everything results to like doom and gloom if you look online, you know, which is not, it's not great, you know, um, but like I say, with, with the hearing thing, they found I had this disease 
um, that was destroying my hearing. Um, in other words, it was, just, it was attacking my middle ear. I had a disease of the middle ear. So the middle ear is kind of like, if you think about, um, you've got your outer ear, which is a bit like a microphone, if you think, like picking the sound up. And then your inner ear, which kind of looks a bit like a snail, that's like your um, speaker. So in between, you need something to amplify the sound, and that is your middle ear. And you're born with cells in it, and when them cells die, they don't replicate. You know, it's, it, it, it doesn't sort of get better. That's why they do things like cochlear implants, which is kind of bypasses all that uh, and goes direct to your inner ear, <coughs> which is something I might need at some point, but um, I lost a lot of hearing. Um, and I, as I was losing hearing, I, I learned to play my instrument, and um, which was a guitar predominantly. I wanted to learn it at primary school, but my mum and dad couldn't afford to buy me a guitar, so I had to wait until I was... Uh, Went to college and I got my first grant was I think it was about um, it was about 110 quid I think I got it's quite not much for a college grant you know that was for a, a term I think so I Argos catalogue out back then I'd have been about 17 18 a friend had given me an old an old acoustic you know that I, I got some basics down this book tune a day and I'm you know I wanted to be playing rock stuff you know and I'm there playing old McDonald and Jingle Bells and Come By Ya. You know, but we all have to start somewhere, you know, and it, it, uh, if I was to teach someone now, I'd probably teach that similar sort of way. You know, these, these songs, they might not be, you know, the best songs, but they, it's the same stuff in them. But, um, but yeah, I got me, uh, me, me first guitar, but it was as I was going deaf, I was learning to play. It was the timing of it. that my body sort of accepted this new kind of thing um, because your senses do kick in. Your other senses will kick in and take over. So I'm currently classed as conductively deaf. I don't wear hearing aids. Yes, I do struggle immensely. Uh, sometimes people talk to me and you don't hear the full sentence. So your brain tries to autofill and you'll give them the complete wrong answer. You know, sometimes people are talking to you and you, you don't, you know, it's not a case of you being ignorant. You just not heard them. You know, at first I didn't like it. I was scared. I, I didn't go out, you know, because I was 18 at the time and I thought, oh, I want to go out, I don't want to mix with people, I'm deaf, you know, and uh, it was horrible. And then after a while I just thought, you know what, there's nothing I can do about it, it's not my problem. So I had to have two surgeries, which was six months apart, because they would, they would not do both ears at the same time. I took a big tumour out of one ear, um, and they create these cavities, because it's called a mastoid exploration. So basically the disease had eaten the, um, you know, it attacked the middle ear and the mastoid bone, which is the bone that runs like if you, so if you tap it, you can hear, because I mean, when you tap that, you're hearing that with your inner ear. That's how they test the hearing loss, the sound that goes through or the sound that goes in via the bone. And um, so that's how they can, they can see my deafness level. So I've currently got about 60% in my right ear, which used to be my worst ear when it was all happening. And I'm, I'm probably down to a little above 30% left in my left ear. So um, I do struggle, it's hard, and a lot of people would not think it, you know, when I'm playing an instrument, it's like, it's, but it's, I've got used to it. Your body does adapt, and it is challenging, and you just do the best you can, you know, and that, your best will always be good enough, you know, it will always be good enough. And don't be put off, because there's, you know, a band that I, I used to, you know, I still love today, that's Def Leppard, you know, their drummer, he lost an arm. What did he do? He wanted to play drums again, you know, and um, did he did he do it? Yeah, still doing it today, you know. He was, what, 21, something like that, when he lost his arm, you know, and he's, that was back in 1984, 85, something like that, and he's, he's just been doing a world tour now, you know, and just with one arm, you know, and so you think, you know, there's people out there, I think there used to be another percussionist who was deaf, female percussionist, so it's not that they're special, it's just that they, they work with what they've got, you know. So with, with tinnitus, it's an irritating thing, um, but there are ways around it, which I use a thing called in-ear monitoring, which I'll look at regarding some of the other questions later on. Right, I've got some questions about Kane now. So, because um, this is going to be a really long video, this one, by the look of it. But uh, nevertheless, you wanted these uh, questions, so um, I'll, I'll answer them all. 
how hungry is Kane most of the time? Right, well first, for those of you who have not seen Kane, I will uh, get him out and um, just briefly show you before I pop him back in, because he's not the lightest of uh, things. And he's right in the far corner at the moment. Sometimes he's reluctant to come over, so I have to sort of grab his shell and just try and drag him over a little bit. And he's a little bit grumpy. So, oh, and he weighs a bit. So that's Kane. For those who've uh, not seen him before. Well, he's 16 years old now. When I bought him, he weighed um, one ounce, 29 grams where now he's probably anywhere between sort of, he varies, he goes up and down between sort of 45 and 50 pound. So he's like a lump of concrete, to be honest. You know, um, this thing here is called a tortoise table, which I much prefer to a Bavarian. So, um, how hungry is Kane most of the time? That varies. Sometimes it can be an absolute pig where all he wants to do is eat. And sometimes it can be a bit picky. It depends. If, if, if certain people in the house have been giving him treats like lots of strawberries and tomatoes, he'll turn his nose up at greens, which they're supposed to eat greens because he's, he's, he's an African spurred tortoise. He's a sulcata. He's not a, he's not a spur side. You know, some people get um, mixed up between them and the uh, adult size is very different. So he's an African spurred tortoise, or a sulcata is the sort of Latin name. Uh, trying to get a, diff you know, a definitive answer on how long they live. As far as I'm aware, the, long, the oldest one in captivity was about 50 odd, I think. Um, which kind of answers another question later on down the line. You know, or does he snack regular or scoff a lot? Same again, it depends what mood he's in. If he's nice and toasty and warm, and he's because you don't have to feed them every day, and he's not eating for one or two days, you can put a massive pile of food, which I've got some food here ready, you know, because when I make it, I don't make it in little piles, it's made in a big bowl, you know, it's a washing up bowl. You know, that's basically his indoor diet, which is basically most of it's homegrown. There's carrots, courgette, different types of lettuce, some spring greens, all chopped up in there. And it's, it, I put some like additives like a, a powder in there, not much. And that's what he predominantly eats inside and outside to top his diet up. But most of the year when he's outside walking around, he'd be eating the grass. Because you can't get better than natural grass for him because they are a grazer. So they'll quite happily eat all day long nibbling. A bit like a cow really. I mean, they have been sort of um, related to like being classed as a, a goat in a shell. And I can understand that. You know, um, temperament wise, yeah, he can be quite grumpy. Um, <clears throat> does he like being by himself? To be honest, I, I don't think he, he could care less. <coughs> I think he's quite happy. Have you near him? And when he doesn't, he'll let you know. He'll, um, he'll, he'll, he'll shunt into you and it can um, really hurt because that shell at the front is very, very sharp. Um, so you've got to always um, be on your guard when you're going near them. They're not like a dog where they come bounding over happy. They might appear to be happy when they're coming over because they get used to being fed. So they come over thinking you've got food mainly. That's, they're, not, they're not coming over going, yippee, my, you know, my owner's here. It's, have you got any food for me? So this is why I say something, we tolerate each other, you know. He's, he gets quite a cushy life outside. Not, obviously not as good as the wild, nothing as good as in the wild natural habitat. But he's not from Africa, you know, he was, he was bred in the UK. Um, and he, he, uh, he spends quite a lot of time in this box, you know, through the winter months, because I can't maintain the heat outdoors. Um, the heat outdoors, you know, obviously, uh, today out there um, on the thermometer, it's, it's, it's 11 degrees. I can't really let him go below 13 that's a low, you know, I've got to try and maintain his, his main temperature is like mid 20 to 30 degrees. So I obviously the different lights, um, which obviously you've got obviously a tube here, which is a UVB, which is so important. They need that. 
um, which is like sunlight, a UVA, which kind of um, stimulates natural behavior. So they're two natural spectrum lights. And then you have an infrared heat lamp because they're supposed to not be able to see the red, but he's aware that it's on sometimes. And then I have a ceramic heat lamp. Um, and because this room's fairly warm and it's small, he doesn't have, if I, if I have no heat on in there, he tends to stay around sort of 21 degrees most of the time in there, which he's, he's, cause he's an adult now, he's quite hardy to, I mean, I could actually have no heating on at all for him in here, as long as he doesn't get cold, but I know what to look for when they slow down a bit. Cause you do, I do slow him down a little bit in the winter time because this time of year now it's, it's, it, I think it's their mating time. So, um, that's why he's a little bit grumpy, you know, because he's male and something. You, you find, you, it's hard to tell male or female when they're young, but you soon find out when they uh, sort of uh, show you the goods. In other words, you know, you, you think, oh my God, right, yeah, it's definitely a boy. So uh, let's have a look what else we've got here. All these solitary animals. You will often find uh, groups of females in the wild. Uh, you can keep females you know a, a group um it's not advised to have a lot of males yes they will tolerate it depends on the specific temperament and there is a pecking order for breeding rights you know so but it's not advised because they can uh, they are quite an aggressive tortoise the soul catter is known to be a little bit aggressive um you know you've got the big galapagos and the, i think it's the aldrava tortoise you know they've been known in in some wildlife places to uh, attack them and it's the persistence of keep ramming um, because they have the um, the big shell parts that come underneath here what they tend to do is flip other tortoises over um, but yeah he's he, you've got to be careful with him he can he can cause you some damage so never just sort of like let him play you've got to read the body language and you know? i think you, you get to know that over time that you can think well, they're a bit that way out and sometimes he'll come up and he'll just turn sideways to you and he'll, he'll stop and that means that side of things mean he's he's come over and he just wants to be by you and you can walk around and he, will he follow me yes probably because he thinks i might have some food but i don't think there's anything like a like a, a cat or a dog where they're sort of like you know you're the you're their world type of thing you know there's nothing like that with him He's, he kind of thinks like here he is if you get out for me so uh does he like his pond or just drink and waddle around in it um they do have a funny internal system regarding their waterworks you know they um when they go for a, a wee sometimes they have uh water but it's predominantly you know it's like a white paste which is like a uric acid as long as it's not too gritty you know or get stones in it um so they get a lot of the food from uh vegetation um but they do need water or access to water he doesn't have a water bowl in here because he'll just tip it up because things like that he just throws them about as a paddy with so i have to actually physically you know, move him in the bath um, and give them a soak in there because they can absorb liquid, liquid through the skin. They can obviously kind of draw it in through the, the back end, the, the cloacal bit, and um, flush out there. But they tend to try and hold on, they hold on to water, and then they can get rid of the uric acid. And then when they get a replenishment of water, then they'll let the water go. It's quite a complex system, but that's um, probably years and years of evolution. You know, um, they are quite designed well in some ways and in some some ways they're not you know but um but yeah so that's um so that's that part we came uh, let's have a look um he likes his pond if it's hot he'll go in it to cool down if he's thirsty he'll have a drink out of it he does go in it sometimes when it's really hot he'll lay in it and he'll be laying there for ages and sometimes he'll kick his legs back trying to splash himself so I'll, I'll throw some water over him and sometimes he'll be laying out there and you can tell they start like drooling a bit and that's that's the way they, they wipe that that's like the sweat gland type thing sometimes i'll just mist him with some cool water you know but he, he is a desert tortoise so he's not supposed to be kept damp you know so i don't have him on grass full time because he can get shell rot underneath so you, you've got to have that desert sort of terrain where his substrate or his bedding in there is pelleted straw so obviously when he, he wheezes or spills anything, it will swell up. So I have to clean that out. So that's a constant thing I have to buy. But luckily, because he spends a lot of time outside, 
and then when he's not in here or outside he'll be down in the kitchen because i have a large full spectrum bulb that i'll hang up in there and i'll let him wander around in the kitchen you know and i'll just scatter his food around so he's got to you know i've got to mop clean and mop the floor scatter around the line and when he'll walk around it's as if he's grazing otherwise he'll just sort of lay on his food and eat it because they aren't very lazy you know um, but they do like walking a line you know you can have a fence in this big area but they tend to just walk up and down the perimeter they like to be close to something an edge i don't know whether it's just a natural instinct to protect from predators or not i don't know because they are you know instinctively still wild um what else have we got uh, how full am i free many freezes right now some quick swig of me brew um rammed was a really full to be honest um i had a bit of a shifty around the other day because i had to go and get some uh meat in because i thought i've got all this veg you know i want some meat to eat with it still got some salad stuff as well so still got some tomatoes left i put them in the fridge to hold them back you know still got probably well, two or three pound of tomatoes you know that are going through but um I thought I'll, I'll work out what I've got. So I'd, I'd stacked all my cauliflower to one side to put, make sure I've, I've got like the, um, the old, the, the newest stuff is at the bottom of the pile, if you know what I mean. And I've got um, 22 bags of frozen cauliflower and they're not small bags, kind of like nearly A4 size bags of frozen cauliflower and around the same of broccoli. So that's just two vegetables. And you think there's peas, climbing beans, peppers, uh, and then the blueberries, you know, which um, I'll probably show you. I make mean, lollipops out there, more cheesecakes. I've no cheesecakes because they don't last five minutes and they get eaten. Um, but my lollies, I'll bulk, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bulk do them. I'm always doing this scratching now. That's an annoying sound that when he starts doing that. Sometimes it's kind of signaling that he's, he wants a bit of a nap, he wants the sun to go down, sort of thing. Because in the wild, they do burrow. Uh, so. Does my family have a go-to recipe for harvests? Um, it's, it's, it's obviously just maybe part of the day, the cooking, really. Um, I don't know if it, Jill has a particular go-to thing, but uh, for me, um, my go-to thing, there's not that many, to be honest. Um, probably, you know, I like the roast dinners. Um, the spaghetti bolognese, also lasagna, which is what we're on for tea today. So I've, I've sort of pre-made that. I just need to build the lasagna up, which is all homegrown stuff, apart from obviously the mints, you know, but you could put just vegetables in it, making vegetable lasagna. I like salads. Um, it's the thing is, is that I'm not massively keen on vegetables because of the way I was brought up. You know, I, I wasn't exposed to them at a, at a young age, you know, I was sort of like, sugar fuel chocolate sweets all that sort of junk food um so trying to convert a child that's stubborn it's like mm, i don't want that it was difficult so i make it in my head that if i'm going out there and make it go into the trouble of growing it 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 makes me sort of want to eat it more because i know it's good for me yes it might not taste as good as like a lovely plate of chips covered in ketchup but everything in moderation I can still have those things. And yeah, one of my favourite meals to this day would be chips. Give me a plate of chips. But it's homegrown potatoes still, so it still kind of counts. It's not the healthiest thing, but everything in moderation, you know. And in growing it, you're outside the fresh air and it's exercise. So you can do these sort of little guilty pleasure things and not feel so bad about it. You know, rather than going like everything is wrapped in plastic, ready-made, whacking it in, you know. Yeah, I like pies. You know, sometimes I'll make pies, but sometimes I have small frozen pies in because it's handy for me, my father. If, if we're having something that he doesn't like, it's something that can be cooked quick rather than, you know, preparing a complete different meal all the time, you know. Um, and obviously any surplus stuff that's um, like meals that are made, if it can be frozen, it'll be frozen in small batches so they get you know my dad will eat them you know so it, it, it all gets used um oh that, which is another question do i have any particular plans for ex excess produce that isn't kind of stored 
I don't really have any excess, to be honest. I mean, sometimes through the season, my family will sort of like say, oh, have you got any of this, have you got any of that? But I am quite reluctant to give it away because I've found in the past, you you know, you, you go, oh, I've got a load of stuff here, have this, have this, and then you run out. You're thinking, oh, right. So I have to be sure whether I'm going to get some away. Obviously, the family, they want some salad or something like that, and I've just had a harvest, and I've got like 18 bags of mixed lettuce stuck in fridge, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get the same again in about a week. Yeah, because only I can sit eat so much, but this fella here, no problem. He can he can eat quite a bit. He can eat his own size. If I ever let him, his own body size a day in food. You know that'd be like you walking up to some a mass of food that's the same size as you, or it's like a a human sized mound of salad, and lettuce leaves, and just eat the lot. You know, so that would cost a bit. So obviously, um, you know, if I can grow a few hundred lettuce a year and some greens and other things for even courgettes and that, and carrots, it all, it's less to buy and I know where it's been grown. Because I do alter the soil for some things. I put more calcium in the soil for greens because he does need high calcium intake for his shell, which is why you need, obviously, a UVB light, uh, which is just a long tube. Do I ever grow squash? Uh, not very often. I have done. Um, obviously I've done pumpkins and that, but I've done butternut squash well, years ago. Um, did all right, you know, it was just at the time it didn't really get eaten, you know. Um, but the butternut, yeah, it was a big plant, you know, and you, you, you couldn't see much of it until you started clearing it. So oh, there's quite a few under here, you know, and you'd make sure it was clean and it would store quite well, but um, it was just sort of like left and left and left because nobody really knew what to do with it at the time. It's coming back probably. <sighs> 10, 12 years that possibly, but uh, since then I think I've tried, um, I think it was Turk's Turbine. Um, I used some of them, but it was only, like I say, it's not, not my favourite thing. Uh, will I do them again? Yeah, if I've got the space and I'm thinking like, there's, there's an area of, of, of ground that I'm thinking, I really don't know what to put in there. And that's where I'll try new things or I'll, I'll think, oh, I'll put a few squash in there or swede, because I'm not a big fan of swede or turnips. Um, so uh, that's what the gap fillers like that. I'll, I'll think, oh, you know, I'll, I'll pull some out early, and I'll stick a squash plant in. You know, because the squash go out kind of June time, June July, grow, and then the the skin sets nice, and they'll, they'll keep for a while. So uh, yeah, I've grown squashes, um, but it's not on my highest sort of preference to do. Obviously, my plot beers are wet. Uh, you know, I've got the space free in the garden. Yeah, I would do them in the garden, but uh, usually the garden is usually the first thing that begins and the last thing to finish because it's it, it's not as wet and it's just outside my back door as well. Um, what do I feed my sweet peppers? Well, this year, um, I mean, a normal tomato feed's fine, um, but they do require potash or you know or potassium. But I think if you get a general balanced fertiliser in the soil, like blood fish and bone meal, or just some good homemade compost or bought compost, you know, mix that in the soil. Um, and just once they start to, because um, they need a bit of nitrogen at the start to get the leaves going, but once them um, fruits settled, if you start seeing flowers in that, you need that's when they need the more um, potash. Um, I mean, obviously the phosphates are more for like the roots, for healthy root, root which you do need. I mean, every plant needs good roots because it needs them to pick everything up, you know, all the nutri nutrients up and, and drink. And obviously watering um, is quite weird, really, with peppers because I've, I've found, you know, um, possibly might answer another question. But with peppers, I found that even though it's water in the pots, I didn't really do much with the top growth. Um, but in the ground, I found I didn't have to let them run dry. You know, I found with plants like that is kind of when they've got no flowers on them, or you've got you've got a nice big plant with lots of green on it, and it's, you start to see some little tiny buds forming. Let it dry out a bit so you see the leaves wilt, and then pump it with water and feed. And it's like it's gone through a shock thing that you wouldn't do for other plants. Like if you did it to onions, you'd be mortified because it all bolt to seed but that's what you're after with a pepper plant you want it to go to seed so i think in, in giving it that little shock it thinks like 
well, that was that was near the end then, and it thinks you know it's had a dry spell, so it's going to think right. I'm going to put all my efforts in now to producing seed, which is obviously flowers and your bell peppers. Same with chilies. Tomatoes will work the same, but you've got to be careful with with it so, because you get blossom end rot, you know, which is irregular watering, calcium uptake. There's always multiple elements, um, so. It is hard to get all them elements. You can get a soil test, I, I suppose, but having a good mix of composts, um, probably more so than feeding, I'd probably say if you've got a good ground with compost in it, you'll you'll do okay. Um, it's a watering thing, and I found that you know if you grow them open in the air outside, they don't do as well. Um, and I've I've got my own sort of opinion on growing them in the where I've done so well this year. Uh, under a mini tunnel rather than in the polytunnel because they like humidity you're supposed to sort of mist them with tepid water peppers and I think in a polytunnel or um, a, a greenhouse your pepper plants are not very high you know so the microclimate the, the roof where the, the sort of inner and external temperatures differ that kind of creates a bit of a, a, like a thermal layer um, and I think because it's way up higher the humidity is not quite the same so I think if you bring that top down the humidity is more condensed around the plants I'm going to knock his lights off because he's starting to try and dig in the corner um, but yeah I think it's that that's what does it if you if you for, well for me I, that's what I think anyway my own personal opinion is with me having the mini tunnel really close to the plant I think that's helped out and kept that humidity all around the plant rather than being like a you know a pepper plant in a large open still a heated space but obviously that moisture can lift up and, and, and escape around there's a lot of a lot of free space in there but like I said that's just my own, own opinion that's the only thing I can see that's different you know apart from obviously in the ground or in a pot both good ways um, but that's all I've really changed. I haven't had to water as much because there's natural moisture in the ground and um, the, the tops have been fine, you know, um, they've, they've done well. Pest attacks, yeah, but I, mean, I can't grumble this year. It's been a great year for peppers, you know, and will I do it the same next year? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably, if I had the space and the, the time and the money to make it, I'd probably design something that's specifically for peppers and chilies that's low, you know, polycarbonate things and lift up lids, keep everything short and bushy you know i think it'd be good as long as there's good airflow through you, you you eliminate a lot of other things and, and a bit of pruning if you need to um, and obviously feed wise just tomato feed high potash feed um what do i feed my sweet peas um the same um just tomato feed anything that creates a flower does better with a, a, a potash. You know, in fact, tomato feed is a good all rounder, whether it's Tomorite or any other brand, granular brand that's, you know, uh, water soluble, anything like that. The general thing is, as long as it's got a higher potash, you can like just buy a potash on its own, you know, which is what I do sometimes. I'll get them by, I think it's Kempak. You can get the nitrogen, um, potassium, and phosphate. And you can get the other one, trace element, minerals and calcium, and you can make your own up. So if you want something that the MPK is something like, you know, 5, 10, 10, you know that you go, well, I put one of them, then two of them and two of them in, you, you double it, you know, and it kind of, so you can alter what you need more. You know, obviously, plants that you don't want loads of leaves on, keep, keep the nitrogen down. You know, if you've got loads of greenery you need, nitrogen needs to be high. You know, the middle bit is for kind of the, 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 the potash, not the potash, it'd be um, phosphates, early growth, root establishment. Um, that's why um, it tends to be later season, season feeds tend to be lesser on the, the, the actual um, phosphates. And they work at nitrogen, which is basically foliage and flower. If you think of it that way, nitrogen, foliage, potash, flower, phosphate roots. If you think of it like that, it's your MPK. That's why, in my own opinion, but obviously you've got calcium, magnesium and all these other things. So they're in a thing called trace elements. Um, they don't need large quantities. They should be found in the soil if you've added natural 
the organic matter to them, it, it will build up its own. Obviously, it gets depleted. So, if you're a good, a good mix of many different things put on the soil, it will find its own balance. What guitar amp and pedals do I use? Uh, we shall look at that one in a moment, I think. Um, got one from Willow Grove, which is Lindsay. So, hi, Lindsay. Um, fishing, what is my fave species of fish? Um, because apparently the sun likes tench. Um, I've not had tench for a couple of years now, but uh, yeah, they're a lovely little fish, a little olive green with a teddy bear eye. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a fish I, I grew up fishing for, really, tench. Um, I do pick them up now, but it's, it's finding the places where they stock them. Um, but my favourite species, I don't really have a favourite species, to be honest, but um, I would say it would lean towards my favourite fighting fish ever has been the, um, the Wells catfish. Um, you know, on the odd chance, so I've had a chance to fish for them. Only in the UK, I've never fished abroad. It kind of spoils it for some people. They go abroad, fish, they come back here, and it's like, oh, they're not as big. It doesn't really matter about the size of the fish. Just use light to tackle for smaller fish. You know, it doesn't, just because it's not like 30, 40 pound, you know, yeah, it's like you've used a real broomstick of a rod for that. Just use a small, it's still fun. You're out on the bank, fresh air, catching some fish. It doesn't matter really how big it is, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just as long as you're enjoying it, it keeps you out, especially for young kids and that, keeps them out of trouble. Um, but yeah, I'd probably say catfish for the fighting thing. Um, I do have a high respect for pike, you know, because they are, uh, they've got it right. They've been around for a very long time. So um, evolution not changed much and they're still pretty much the same. And they're, um, they're, a, they're a good apex predator. They, get, they don't prey on healthy fish all the time. They will just, because they're naturally uh, opportunistic. And they'll think, well, hang on, there's a fish there that's injured or dying. I don't have to chase it very far. So they have a role in that. You take away the predators, you have a buildup of disease. So this is why there needs to be a, a good balance of both predator and prey in any walk of life, really. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say, yeah, for fighting, it would be catfish, um, pike, and carp. But a fish I really do miss that I've not fished for for many years is the crucian carp. I used to lo love catching them as a, as a kid, fishing in little matches and stuff like that, catching this little like, gold bar. You know, um, crucian carp, yeah. Fish on a little float on a little bread flake where you go to a local manure heap and dig some worms. But it's mainly like getting in trouble off my mum for stealing half a loaf of bread and going up to local ponds and fishing for crucian carp. But yeah, great memories of my childhood, that was. You know, best years of my life. Um, was probably from, you know, the ages of 10 to 15, I really fished so much. Um, and I intend fishing more. I have started going again occasionally. Um, I might set a camera one day and, and do a bit. It's just a local pond. Um, my sister, you know, she, she treated me for my birthday and paid for my membership because I just couldn't afford it. You know, and she realised I need a bit of a rest from, you know, this situation. And I, uh, I need it, something that's just for me, I can sit there and relax. And it's full of carp, it's, it's uh, kind of F1s, you know, so it's like heavily stocked and it's quite repetitive. You get there and you're catching loads of small mirror carp and, and common carp, you know, anywhere sort of from two pound up to 12 pound, maybe something like that. It's a good bit of sport. I don't fish more heavy gear, he's quite light gear, you know. Um, yeah, so if your son's favorite fish is a tench, it's not a bad one at all. It's, it's, it's a lovely fish and it's very difficult to catch the big ones. Um, they're quite rare, um, but yeah, tench, tench are a lovely fish. And they're also known as a doctor fish because there's something to do with the slime on them. Um, has a sort of medicinal purpose. So other fish can be found brushing against the tench um, to, to heal skin abscesses because they do pick up skin problems in spawning because they're crashing around and the tench is kind of known as the doctor fish apparently so whether it is I don't, I don't know but um, yeah tench is a lovely fish you know really especially it, the water quality is good they have that lovely olive green colour and that teddy bear eye on them you know I um, used to watch all them John Wilson on Channel 4 go fishing series as a kid Fishing for tench, you know, on sweet corn or casters or bread. 
you know, but uh, predominantly these days it's a lot of um, commercial fisheries and it's pellets and boilies, you know, but uh, you can still catch them the old way though. I think if, um, in some aspects, the old ways would outfish the new ways. It's just convenient the new way. I think you don't have to go and dig your worms and things like that. Uh, but the thing is with commercial fisheries that some of them fish have never seen a natural bait. You know, they, 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 they were hatched, fed pellets all the upbringing, then put in the lake. So they, they've got to discover these new things um, and they've become dependent on that um, high amount of pellet feed going in. But uh, it's not a bad thing, you just keep an eye on the water quality and um, good balance of predator and prey fishing there and the water will maintain itself. You know, you don't want this big hole in the ground sort of thing, it's trees, weeds, a bit of natural weed growth, create a natural environment which takes time to populate. When you just dug a hole it takes years for it to um, naturally populate. Things will go there naturally, frogs, beetles, newts, they will all naturally go there. You know, you create that environment. It's a bit like Field of Dreams, you build it, they will come, eventually. Um, so that right. does Cain hibernate? No. Uh, sometimes I wish he would. Uh, it would give, a, give me a little bit of a break, but uh, no. Unfortunately, the uh, African sulcata, or the African spurred tortoise, does not hibernate. So um, I have to keep him toasty warm all winter long. And then on the warm days in the summertime, well, spring, summer and autumn, really, um, it goes outside. As long as the temperature is... I'm okay, a steady sort of 18 is not too bad outside. Um, not so much air temperature, you've got to feel, feel the shell, but I have thermometers dotted about so I can, I can check it. Um, but don't let them go below 13 for long because um, they can have um, fatal consequences um, because obviously they can't cough. So they get, they get a build up of fluid on the lungs and they basically suffocate. So you've just got to be uh, careful. You couldn't put them out there and uh, and then fall asleep in winter. You know, you, you, they go out there in the snow. You know, <laughs> that's fine. Give them like, you know, as long as they've warmed up before and put them out. If they're not moving anywhere, it's pointless and being out there. You know, unless it's a nice bright sunny day. If it is, if you've got something dark, you can put down the ground or some black tarmac area, so absorb some heat. That that natural daylight is the best thing for them. So. You know, the tubes and everything are only good as a really cloudy day, um, which will have an impact, you know, on it's, nothing will beat the natural wild, lush grasslands and natural sunshine. Uh, there's no um, replicate for that that's, that you can buy at all, you know, in, in my opinion. I think it's all, if you, the more natural stuff you give, the better. But if you can provide the best you can, that should be enough. Right, I think I'll have a, a brew, uh, another brew and then um, we'll get back to these questions. Right, what's well, this question regarding like um, what amps or pe and pedals do I use? Um, it's a bit different nowadays than it used to be. You know, back in the 90s, I was more of a conventional sort of guitarist in a band. Um, we'd have these little single pedals. You know, if you're a musician, you'll know basically they'll distort the sound or they'll make the sound, you know, and you, you put them and you have to switch them on independently. So your guitar would go into the pedal uh, and then it would go into your amplifier. So um, I still have amps, obviously. Um, different types, I mean, this, this amp behind me here, and you can see it's a little um, Marshall Valve State 8080. I bought that back in 94, 95. Uh, great amp, that's why I've never got rid of it. I've added a couple more since and I've got rid of them, but I've kept that. And then my last amp I bought, probably uh, going back a few years, not as long ago, probably about uh, eight years ago, was uh, this big fella. Um, so this is the, just a Marshall, it's a four, four by 12 inch uh, cab. So there's four speakers in that. Um, and it's got a 100 watt, I can see that. Uh, it's a 100 watt DSL, so it's dual, you know, um, dual super lead. Um, it's got a, an attenuation switch on the back of it so I can knock it to 50 watts, but it's so loud. And this is a problem, it's, it's more gig to, uh, gear to lug around, you know, stages are getting smaller, um, and it's just ease of setup. So I actually don't use an amp, as funny as it sounds. Um, so we'll have a look at what I do use now in my current sort of. Uh, situation which has been for the last sort of you know i have gigged with this a few times but it's predominantly um i use uh, amp simulators now 
which has uh, pedals in it as well. So uh, we'll look at because I'm not going to get all my pedals out. Um, but yeah, it used to be a case if you go out the guitar into something like an, an overdrive or a distortion into the front of the amp on your input, and then you have a thing called an effects loop. And then in that loop, you'd put things like a, a delay, a chorus. Uh, sometimes you put a phaser at the front or a wah pedal because you had this. Um, all your, all your pushing sort of sounds, they went in the front of the amp and then your ambient lush sounding, they went in the loop. And then you'd have your obviously, you know, because your input levels are in and your output levels, um, obviously it's, it's like a, a power amp, that volume, that's your overall volume. The things that go in front of it affect the sound. What's in the loop and the power amp don't really affect the, um, the, the actual um, tonality of the guitar too much because every guitar does have a slight different sound, which we'll look at after. I'm not going to play every guitar, but I'll show you each guitar that I own anyway. Um, so uh, like I said, this video is going to be a real long one. So um, don't don't think you have to watch it all. I might, might try and put it um, something in the description for sort of tags for certain areas, but uh, feel free to come back and watch whenever you like, because there's going to be a lot in this one. I thought I'll do it this way rather than splitting it all up. So we'll have a look at what I actually currently use live. All right, so this is what I currently use live. Uh, this is called the Helix Floor, um, made by Line 6. There's umpteen amp modelers out there, but it has all your individual pedals in, like your overdrives and everything. That there at the back, just behind it, it says Head Rush on it. That's the speaker I use if I want to hear it like an amp. Um, because that, that speaker is classed as a, um, an FRFR, which stands for full range flat response, which means it has no added low end or high end. So what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. Because a lot of, sh a lot of like, speakers and, and headphones, and that, they shape the sound. So for, for musicians, you are always better off with a, an FRFR because an amp simulator is trying to simulate an amp, which will have its own sound, the speaker. So it tries to simulate that as well. So you need as flat a sound as possible coming out. Um, so I don't use that live. I do have a, a speaker on the floor, which is for my, what I need to hear, um, as well as in-ear monitoring. Um, but yeah, I use the Celix floor. So I don't know whether you'll be able to see this because it's a digital display. This is actually the, the, the whole set that I use for my current gigs. It's not really focusing that well, but um, get different sounds with each pedal. You know, that at the moment just says drive, then I have a push drive, lead. So, if I'm doing any lead solos, all that does is boost the volume of what I'm playing. And clean sounds that's Shine Sank, that's what I've called that one. Basically, it's She Sells Sanctuary, that's what I do the intro with. I'll show you in a minute anyway. And I pick which is just basically the same as that, but just a little bit louder. You can preset it all in, you can change your banks if you want to. You know, choose. I mean, I've got uh, the drop tunes it, and one for uh, the Beatles, one called Come Together, and then obviously a Green Day song called Boulevard. I use that. You can set a separate one for every song, but I still kind of use it a bit like a conventional way. And that's pretty much what I do all the gigs with now. Um, and that, that just basically goes straight to the mixer, which then goes to the big speakers, which then go out to the audience, and I get what I need. Because what I hear is very different than what you hear outside in the front of the speakers. I get what I need to hear. And sometimes you don't need to hear everything. So um, we all have our independent monitor feed, which is like obviously, that's kind of like a monitor, how it's positioned there. So if you were in a, on a stage, you'd hear what you want out of that speaker. And everyone has their own. And um, that way then, if you don't want too much bass guitar, you don't have to. That's your mix that's coming out of that speaker. And the audience don't hear it if it's set right. Obviously, you, you, your audience speakers, which are called front of house, um, they are set louder for the audience. So I'll just quickly show you what I mean by pushing the pedals, because I think somebody said like in a, in a comment um, a while ago, what's that box that you've, you're pressing on with the lights on? Well, that's, that's what it is. And I'll, I'll just briefly show you what it does. So I've got my guitar out as well. Right, I don't know how well you'll hear this because it's just going to pick up from me microphone. So I'm using my, uh, which I'll show you after me, Gibson. Um, I'll go through them. Um, 
I can't play too many parts of proper songs because you, YouTube strikes you for copyright otherwise. Um, but I have a, a general clean sound. You know, that's what I tend to use for one of the recent ones I uploaded, which was the... Um, And then obviously the uh, Shine Sank one is for the, that one. And then um, I have this one, which is just basically, it starts to get a bit more distorted. So I've got a crunch, it's just slightly driven. And then a bit more distorted. A little bit more distorted for the... Uh... And then this is for a bit like a pick type, so anything that's slightly a bit louder. And I can alter the sound with my guitar a little bit. Full one for lead solos, where it's got a bit more ambient stuff on, and a bit louder. It's got a volume pedal on it on that end to quiet it down. So that's what I use for all my gigging now. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, so yeah, if I had an amp, I'd, I'd, there's plenty of amps. Best thing to do is go and try plenty. Uh, it's just with amps, you're kind of limited to the one you've got. Whereas in this, there's absolutely loads of amps and it's continuously updated. There are other modelers, um, but that's that's it's just it's more portable. You can pretty much go to a gig with that and a guitar. You can do many other things with it as well. You can put your microphone through it and all sorts if you want. But I just use it as a guitar modeler. Um, so there's no, there is a looper on it, but I don't do anything that's pre-recorded. It's all 100% live when I'm doing a gig. So that's what I use live. Um, I need to get a backup really, because if anything goes wrong with that, I'm a bit screwed. But they are not cheap. But I've had that probably um, seven years, I think I've had that. That's the Line 6 Helix. So we'll uh, have a look at another question. All right, uh, Eric and Rachel, um, they've asked a question, say uh, they've lost the basil in pots, just keeps dying. Uh, I'm not an expert at growing basil, and I know what you mean, it does die off quite a bit, and I think it's um, it's, it's kind of a moisture issue. Not, not that it's too dry, but it's quite prone to mildew. So I think if it's sown quite densely in a pot, um, and not regularly picked and thinned out to allow good airflow, and the foliage gets wet and can't dry out properly, um, mildew. Um, there's probably other sort of wilt type things that, that attack the foliage and it goes like a bit black and starts dying. But I think if it's regular, like nipping the tips off it, you know, and, um, and that'll create it to, to bush out, but keep picking it. Um, water it and let it dry out a little bit, but not obviously to the point of wilting. Um, because if compost is too wet, you get compost mites, well, midges and stuff going in there, and that can all cause, you know, cause problems. Uh, but yeah, a very humid environment, um, they're probably susceptible to like a mildew, you know, so they need that good airflow. That's that's all I can really offer on that, I'm afraid. Um, but that's the that's the main issue that I've always had with, with basil is it, it, you, you look at it, it's doing all right, and also some leaves start going a bit black, and you think, well, but yeah, it's like a mildew. It's, it's basically rotten. It needs more airflow, or it's got a little bit too damp. Um, also, um, uh, Stephen had put uh, about photo. Yeah, I got your photographs from Mum's sweet peas. So if I can, if I can rummage them out, if I can get on the computer, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put some of Steve's photographs from Mum's sweet peas up. Um, because he's, he's emailed me. I did, I think I did respond. Um, I usually do, but uh, it's because it's on me YouTube email account. 
So I don't always use that one. I have my personal one, I have separate ones for different things. Uh, otherwise, I'd, I'd get muddled up because I have one for the band and everything. So I think that's uh, the one. Uh, oh, what is my favourite meal to cook with my produce? That was another one from Lindsay uh, Willow Grove, which is um, my favourite meal to cook with my produce. Um, I like a bolognese because I can use that in a spaghetti or a lasagna. It's kind of uh, so you can make a big pot and have a spag ball one day and then a lasagna the next day. And you can use a bit of your salad up as well. So apart from that, I'd probably say a roast dinner. That's that, they're my go-tos. But I'm always open to experimenting. Because um, I find sometimes it's just a time factor. You know, my me, me dad's a bit restrictive. He don't want to try this, don't want to try that. So you can, instead of doing umpteen meals, you try and um, do something that will kind of please everyone without it being the same all the time. So, uh, but obviously, my tomatoes, I eat tomatoes, I've had about four or five months of tomatoes fresh eating and um, I've got enough that's sourced down to see me through till like next July, August, you know, so I, that's, that's enough to have a spag ball um, or a lasagna or something of that staple every week, you know, um, so there's, there's plenty to, you know, to to go out, you know, and eat pizzas, you use a sauce for the pizza base, there's all sorts. Do that. Um, I do like making pizzas and I use my own stuff for it, you know. Um, just another thing, but I'm always up, you know, you always try new things. I mean, I'm still to discover something for cauliflower. I find a few things, you know, where it's hidden in amongst it, but uh, it's just about cauliflower. It's not my favourite, but I do eat it. And it's like, um, I wouldn't say willingly, but uh, when it's on the plate, I'm thinking like, a bit of mustard on it and get it down, it'd be right. Uh, so let's have a look. Next question, uh, have I tried not digging my potato bed over? Yeah, yeah, I've tried uh, a few ways, because obviously at my allotment, um, my potato bed is the only one that's quite labour intensive. Um, I have done it where I've, I've put manure on the soil, covered it up and then dug it in, in the spring or early spring or late winter. I've done it where I've just dug it over and then I've done it where I've, um, just basically trench dug and I've done it where you know I used to dig it and I'd rotivate it and plant everything through holes um, the only thing is if I don't dig it if I dig the trench and plant in the trench method the soil gets that compact through the winter time um, I had a job to harvest them to be honest because he, I dug down like a, a spade wide a trench and when I come to harvest them they were like they hadn't gone out of the trench they'd stayed there and they were like near enough square edged and they'd pin themselves in and some of them were really hard to pull out, you know, so um, I don't think I have to dig every year, but I think it just helps to um, keep the soil in such a way. I, did, I mean, the old fashioned way, you see, you dig it in a big chunk, put a, slit it in four and the frost to come in and smash it up and it'd be great. You know, but um, that just depends. But, but my, you think, you know, in the winter time, the water table on that on that field is about um, an inch below the surface of the raised bed. So if I dig a hole, it just fill it with water. So that's what I mean. It, it, it's hard. Doesn't matter what I put in that soil. It's just starting to change a little bit. But I mean, it's ten years of stuff I've been adding. I mean, I should be on a bloody hill. You know, stuff I put in that bed. But it just goes. You know, that's the thing. Everything you put in, it's constantly getting eaten and spread out by organisms. It's a tricky one. But um, I didn't. I just trench dug it. This year, I think, I can't remember, was it this year? No, last year I trench dug, I had a job getting them out last year. This year, I think I, I dug the full bed. I'll probably, you know, because I've, I've got the green manure on there, I'll probably dig it over, but it just depends next year. When it gets around to February, March, I need to dig it by March, really, to plant in April. So um, I need to make sure, uh, if the weather's been fine, if you've had a dry spell, that the, the water level's dropped in the ground. Because you don't want to dig it and then have a big downpour because it'll just fill it all up because it becomes a drainage point. So um, and then you go plant your buds in it and it'll rot off. That's happened to me before. You know, I dug a bed at my old allotment site, planted the potatoes. Horrendous water logging went on and they just they just rotted. They were just stuck in water, and that happened this year because in the trenches, because I trench dug it this year. Yeah, I remember now I trench dug it, and I think when we had the heavy downpours through July, the rain couldn't drain through the soil everywhere, evenly. So it just sort of all these like dug out, even though you, you, you hill your potatoes up, 
when the, the, the water's sitting around them, it finds somewhere to drain and it's that crumblier soil. It's, oh, I'll go down here. So I've ended up really like filling all my trenches up with water. They've been sat in and a lot of the deeper potatoes were just not blight rotten, they're just water, water on. It just got so wet. So I think, you know, with digging it fully, it just allows that water to be able to spread out and percolate off everywhere else. It's just tricky, it's just uh, the plot I've got to work with, you know, if it was somewhere nearer to home and that, uh, or if it was drier, then yeah, I'd probably say I won't dig, I'll just no dig it. But, um, but I do like growing potatoes, but it's, but, you know, it keeps me fit, at least I'm not having to dig, you know, 300 square foot up like I used to do, you know, years ago, it was, now it's just, I think, well, I've got, uh, it's not small, I mean, it's, what is it, um, well, it's not like square metres, but I mean, it's square foot, so it's like, I think it's 15 by 20 foot. Um, so what's that work out at? I can't think, six and a half yard by five yards, something like that, so like 30 square yards, something like that. Um, so it's, it's not too bad to do. I used to be able to do it in a day, no chance now, probably two days, three days even. Pace myself. Keep your back facing what you've got left to do so you can see what you've done in front of you because if you turn the other way if you're constantly looking at what you've got to do you'll think god i'm not getting anywhere here you know and you can always tell when you get near the end the digging quality tends to lack a bit so just don't push yourself and even you know you can only manage to dig part if you've got to dig like me just dig part just dig part you know it's, it's okay if you can't manage it you if you bung, you'll get something out if you bung something in, you'll get something out but it's just other things might it might be better under your circumstances but I, I think for me there i've got to dig that bed unless if i actually make a you know an eight inch high raised bed and fill it but it would just keep sinking down it's it's, it's not cost effective and it would just be so much work to do it um another question what do i think of nematodes for slugs um, I have tried nematodes for leather jackets and stuff like that and uh, there's a few people I know that have tried them for the slugs and opinions, they didn't work for me, um, yes they're expensive, I believe they do work to a degree but I have my own methods of regarding slugs, um, it's early in the season just before it starts warming up when you start to see them get rid of those Small ones, big ones, slug snails, get rid of them. I don't mean just like sling them in next door because they'll come back, get rid of them. Either tub them up, get a long set of forceps or something, or so you can with gloves, pick them up, put them in a tub, take them miles away. If you want in a big field or whatever, just get rid of them, put them in a, in a, in a you know, as long as it's nowhere near you, you know, because, you know, in the next garden they'll come across. Because uh, it's like an allotment site, if the plot next to you is not well kept, them slugs will come from under all that junk that's laying down and come to your plot. So the idea is, is have least amount of place for them to hide. And if you can, I can't do it at the plot. I wish I could. But why I do it is I go out with a head torch on and um, obviously on a dampish night it's better, but then it doesn't necessarily have to be damp. And you'll see them out as I do with the, um, the flatworms. Get rid of them, dispatch them. Slugs, collect them dispatch of them and that way then you stop the egg laying process you put a dent in it because you, you can go out there and get 30 odd i tend to leave these leopard slugs because apparently they're supposed to eat other slugs but someone said that they eat worms i don't know if they do or not i've not really seen them on my veg i've seen them in the compost heap because they're supposed to eat decaying veg but i used to dispatch them as well but i thought i'll leave them alone and to be honest i don't do bad for slugs in the back garden apart from if i forget to pull a net down securely then it's my fault you know you you're not going to stop it because they'll just dig in from somewhere but if you can make it hard work for them and you can um, reduce it that's as good as you're going to get you're not going to get something that is 100 percent you know complete bug proof I mean, you could grow a plant on a windowsill, you know, and you'll get some that climb through your window if you've got it open a jar and eat the plant on your windowsill. So you can't get away from it completely, but you can just think, how can I reduce the damage? Um, because it's organically grown stuff. It's not like it's floating in a big water bath around a big, you know, uh, complex where it's fed with chemicals and that. You've got something that's grown and it's, it's pulled in natural elements. So, 
you're gonna pull a bit of pest damage you know it doesn't matter it's just because it's not wrapped in polythene nice and neat it's got a few slug holes in it, it doesn't matter just wash it and eat it it's fine once you've got over that you'll look at that and even if you see a tiny aphid on there you think oh well eat that and i'll bug bugger it it doesn't bother i used to be squeamish if you're like i'm not eating that you know be like mites under your lettuce leaves and stuff now it's just just give it a right good wash and be done with it it'll submerge it in water for a while you know some people put things in salt water to, to draw the bugs out you know you can do that with cauliflower heads you know soak them for half an hour in you know a salty solution um and that'll get them out you know it, it can, well salt water is an antibacterial thing it, it fights fungus a bit so it cleans as well um but it doesn't it doesn't always it doesn't sort of uh, affect the nutrient content because when you blanch things they're blanching with salt water and that kind of holds the nutrient content stops a lot of the you know the the the, um, the breakdown process of losses of proteins and minerals and that um what sort of fishing do i do um right well a bit of everything to be honest the only thing i don't do i don't i don't boat fish i have fished out of the boat but um I don't boat fish because for me, you know, I don't I don't belong out there really. I go as far as the water's edge, you know, thinking right, as far as I'm gonna go. Um, personally, because um, there's that many different types of fishing that I do. You know, I, for for every a lot of my friends who I used to grow up with and fish with as a kid, they go in to do just one particular type of fishing. I've always tried to do all sorts. So I do a bit of sea fishing. I'm not done sea fishing. I've not done a lot years because i've just not gone but if i was going you know i can go and catch stuff out off the beach off the seawall off a pier you know off a rocky coastline you know fish for pike um carp catfish you know all fishing with dead baits lures um commercial baits natural baits um drop shot in for perch um which is like a lure fishing type thing uh, fish on the you know Quiver tip, swing tips don't really get seen these days. They were sort of a thing of the 80s of swing tips. You know, a ledger with your fairy liquid bottle top on the line. Um, it worked. It worked back then, it worked now. It's just that there's all this technology, you know, you get the little bite alarms, you can stay tucked up in your bed and you're busy with your little alarm next to your head when you get a bite, it self hooks, you know, there's different types of stuff. But I can still go fish a little pond, catching little roach, rud, perch, little crucian carp, tench, things like that. I can still go and do, do all that. I've always kept me, my finger in all types of fishing. You know, I can get a fly rod. I can all be over the fly rod. You know, I can go to a river and get a couple of trout or chub. Or I'm not bothered about what it is. You know, it's just being on the bank and catching. And you look out and you think, right, what is feeding today in this weather? You know, if it's bright, open sunshine, I wouldn't necessarily target perch and predators because, it, because they, they do better with low light levels. So you'd be better off in the evening or overcast days, things like pike and things like that. Um, they will feed in the sun, you can still get them, but they have a preference, you know, and it's learning watercraft, looking for ambush spots when you're fishing for predators. Um, you, what your bottom's like, if it's gravel, clay, dig seeps, you know, silt pockets. Because fish don't actually like hefty silt because it stinks, it's rotten, decayed, slop. You know, and some old natural pits, you know, you cast out and it's just doing in this brown soup at the bottom and you, your bait's buried in it. But there is still a way, you know, where you silt stain, you, you get like a, an oily mix, fish oil mix or something like that. You know, so it's a natural thing, so it's not bad for them. Um, and you sort of distribute that out there and that sinks to the bottom. But yeah, it puts a, like a film on top of the silt. So it stops that smell because you don't want to be grubbing around in that. And then you use a certain sort of, sort of semi-suspended rig, you know, or a helicopter rig or zig rigs and stuff um, where they can find it because it's, it's sat just on top of it. It's not pulled down because it, it will not grub down it because you can tell when you wind in and you smell your weight, it stinks. You think I'm in a silk pocket there. It's just not going to work. Otherwise, you're looking for little high spots, little gravel bars. Um, wind direction there's loads of stuff elements that come into fishing you know it's quite complex but it's like you're setting a little ambush up to catch something in their environment so it's very tricky you know and it, you, you can't learn it overnight but it's everything's so easy to learn now because it's just internet you can find someone and most people you meet on the bank will talk but if you, if you ever start especially if you're a newcomer to fishing go and ask go and watch people you'll learn so much that way 
uh, or the old fashioned way was just figuring out for me, school holidays, where would I be? Sat by a pond all the time, you know, and if I didn't do the gardening, you know, I didn't have the band, I'd fish. If I had the money, I'd fish, you know, but um, obviously um, doing the gardening gets food in, you know, um, doing the, the videos and everything and, the, you know, the, the, the sponsor stuff, that all helps pay for a lot, you know, a large section of it. And the band, you know, that kind of funds itself in that aspect. So uh, fishing doesn't, unfortunately, you know. Um, uh, sea fishing, yeah, I could go and dig some worms and, uh, you know, some black worm and catch some fish to eat. Should it get to that point, am I willing to do it? Yeah, I've done it before, you know. But yeah, I could quite happily, you know, hold me on. I could sort of think, well, I'll go to estuary, catch some flounders, go to my plot, pick some peas, pick some potatoes and make a meal. And it's not cost me anything because I can dig the, the bait for the flounders on the estuary bank. You know, I can make a natural fire and cook it there, you know, so I, I can do that, you know, because I used to camp a lot when I was a kid as well, you know, so um, there is an element of self-sufficiency there and you tend to enjoy it because you think, I've made this with no modern technology, you know, you don't even need a rod, you can use a hand line, a bit, you know, fishing line, hooking a bit of it and do it like that, There's, there is always a way, you know, the technology looks nice, but that last sort of, it uh, doesn't matter what you've got on the bank when you're fishing. It's that last bit of terminal tackle. That's the bit that you've got to try and keep out of fish's sight and quiet on the bank because they're aware that something's amiss. Because they're not, they're not daft. You know, some some fish can be, you know, a bit daft if there's something wrong with them. But uh, you know, they can wise up over a lifetime. You know, some fish, you know, 20, 30 years old, it's, it's learnt a bit and it. You can throw a lot of bait and you think, why is it taking all them except the one that they hooked in? You don't know why, but it does, you know, and it's frustrating, especially when it's clear sunny weather and you're fishing with, you know, in shallow water and you're stalking carp, you know, and you're thinking it can drive you insane. But um, it's why we do it, it's a challenge, you know, and it is kind of that man against beast type thing, you know, it's, but it's, it's great, there's a lot more women doing it now. When I've, when I've done some of these day ticket waters, you go there and you're thinking, oh, women fishing which is great because it never used to be like there used to be a few mums with the sons and stuff you know but um it doesn't matter it doesn't matter you know what race age sex you are get on the bank you know it's it's, it's kind of like you know um, treat the fish as kind as possible protect them don't have them out of the water for too long it's kind of you know just uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a code of just you know only leave your footprints behind don't leave a lot of mess that's that's all an angler's code is. The only thing you should leave behind are your footprints, and that way then you're not putting too much of an impact on nature, you know. But uh, some people don't like fishing because they think it's cruel. It's a sport, but somebody's going to do it, and you think, well, if I can treat the fish with respect, and there's all sorts of little um, things you can buy now where you, if you've hooked a fish, you can spot treat it, and sometimes you find fish with, with other marks on them, so you treat them while you're at it. So you're actually helping that aspect. Um, obviously, if you're fishing at sea, catching things to eat, um, be aware of size limits. Don't just take everything home and do you need it? If you don't need it, put it back. Because it might be that ideal breeding age where it will give a future supply. You know, there's always got to be enough. You take too much, you'll run out. Uh, have I ever worked as a cook? I look familiar. No, I haven't actually. But uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have even seen myself ever as a cook. Yeah, I can. I can. I can cook a little bit, but nothing flash. Um, I, if I look familiar, we have got to find out who. I don't think I look like any celebrity chefs or anything. Um, might have changed up. Sometimes I have got a full beard. Sometimes I have got a goatee. Um, but uh, no, I've never, never been a cook. Uh, I've never, never thought I've been good enough to do, be a cook. Really, it's just look what's in the cupboard and try and make something that's palatable. <laughs> um, how big is my allotment site? Not seeing anyone out there. Um, it's about 50 to 60 plots. It keeps changing. Um, my plot is 150 square meters. Um, the bigger plots on there are 250. There's a, couple, there's a few on there that are 100. So it just depends. Some people might have like a, a 250 um, plot and then they leave and then they split it. It varies. There are quite a few empty plots like on any allotment site. You get those who come down, 
thinking like I've watched the video on YouTube, I can do this. Go down, dig a bit of an area, put some plants in, go away, come back, it's all full of weeds again. Oh, I'm not doing it anymore. And that plot's left to overgrow seeds and it's a problem for the next person. If you're gonna do it, do it. If not, let somebody else do it. But if you're not sure, Try it in a little corner in your back garden or your yard in a few pots. If you can't maintain a tiny tub with something, you're not going to maintain a plot. And only take on enough that you can manage. Or get pally with a few people and do it between you if you need to. That's that's always an option. Um, and always like slugs, nematodes, pellets. I find pellets, are, you know, they do help. They're not ideal, not everyone likes them. I've not used many pellets this year at all, if any, I don't think. Uh, if I have them, I'll, I'll put them down. But like uh, I've said my views on nematodes, I don't think they're up to much. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, well, yeah, why, why you don't see anyone on my allotment site is most of them don't actually know I have a YouTube channel. I'm quite private that way. Um, some do, you know, and if anyone new comes on, they usually get pointed in my direction and I'll just say, you know, there's my channel. And um, if they've got anything to ask, because I know what it's like to be them, not knowing. And if I had someone I could ask who could, you know, or that's in the same situation, uh, I'd, I'd have had it a lot easier, you know. So, um, but th there are common things you see with new people to come and they're, they're doing it thinking they're, they're, they're doing it right, um, but it's a lot of work. So my, I look at someone thinking like, well, if you're new to this, you want to try and um, get the rewards good and fast for early on. It's a bit like taking a, a kid fishing. If you take him somewhere and he's catching nothing, he's going to get bored, never going to want to go again. And you get someone, you know, uh, take him to, and they do well, then they're more than likely to go back to it. And then they can handle the odd thing going wrong. As long as there's some successes, you know, they'll keep them interested. And then the wisdom is carried on, you know, it's carried on to the next generations because, which is, it's, it's failing in some aspects. You know, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of things. That wisdom is, is missed a generation. And, and you look at the little kids now, you know, sort of like the under tens and you're thinking, how are they going to get this knowledge? You know, there's, They'd have to need to look for it themselves, you know, where uh, I think uh, an allotment is a great place for a family, you know, and they might do it when they're, you know, five, six, seven year old and not do it again. But some might think about it later in life and like me, you remember, oh, hang on, I've got an idea how to do them. It's potatoes. You know, if you can get potatoes in the ground, dig them up, it's like treasure. They'll never forget that because if they planted one and they turn it over and they've got about 15, it's like, wow, you know, it's this is it. But you can't take it and like, put something in and then it, it just fails and then they go, don't see the point in that. And it's the same for adults. There's a lot of work and if it all fails, it's disheartening. But sometimes it's not your fault. If the weather's been horrendous, it is not your fault. You know, but something will always do okay. Just a, it's just the way it goes, you know, no, no two years are exactly the same. Some can be similar, but they're usually quite different. You know, you always get one, one thing that is a bit of a disaster. And you get one thing that's, you know, does well. And something like for me this year, my peppers, surprisingly, you know, I, I thought I'll try this and see how it goes. And it's done great. I can't, I can't fault it in any way. Yeah, I got some pest attacks with little holes in them. But um, overall, you know, tenfold improvement on, on previous years, just no, no comparison. You know, I think you like, get a few big peppers and then also like masses of them. Well, what else have we got? Uh, right, we've got a couple of questions here on, do I use a mixer or does the pub do the sound? Um, I'll answer that because I'll have to get my mixer out for that one, show you that. Um, what guitars do I use? Oh, oh. right, so uh, I think I'll have another cup of tea and we'll have a look at some guitars. Right, so we'll go through some of these uh, guitars that I own. Um, I said they've been bought over many, many years, um, ranging in prices from not very much to a lot of money. Um, but, you know, they're a tool for life, you know, if you look after them. So we'll start off with probably, I've got a couple in the attic, which is what I first started with, to be honest. They're, they're real cheapy ones. Um, well, I think this is probably one of the oldest ones. It doesn't get used. Um, it kind of just hangs as a bit of a decoration, really, I guess. But this is an older... 
Encore 12 string. It's all sort of in tune, more or less. Uh, it's probably first time I've strummed it in about three years. Uh, it just collects dust. Uh, you can see on there, it's dusty. Uh, but, um, I'll probably clean up and restring it at some point, get it all set up again and give it a whirl. Um, yep, yeah, so that's probably, I bought that back in uh, probably about 94, 95, that one. Because I do, I do play some acoustic stuff. Um, I might end up doing some uh, solo gigging next year um, with some, I might build some backing tracks up or just do it with an acoustic, just to fill in some gaps really for a little bit of extra pennies. Uh, this one I bought around 19, uh, about 1997, 98. This is a, a Tanglewood Autumn Leaf. Um, it's a round back acoustic. So I can plug it in to a, you know, a mixer and that, you know. Um. Nice sound. Um, it's got a little cutaway so you can get up the top end, up the dusty end up here and do your fancy stuff. Um, yeah, good guitar. Tricky to play, you know, because it wants to keep scooting off, that's uh, the problem. But it was like, I don't know, my sort of Bon Jovi years, kind of, I like this kind of look. Um, do the old, uh, can't play it all, I can remember how to play it. Uh, something like that, anyway, I can't remember, it's that many years. Um, so that's that one. Um, I'll do this other acoustic, I've only got three. And um, no, only three, it's enough, one's enough really, but you know, it's like you go out and you think, oh, I'll try that, and then you you, you come home with something. Um, this was in, bought when this whole current day band began back in 2015. I needed a, a decent one, and I went into his shop and he uh, tried loads of them out, and he handed me this one because it just come in stock. It's a Faith, it's a Faith Venus Naked, it's called. Um, <laughs> Nice guitar. So plug it. I can plug it all in. It's got all the electronics on it as well, so I can plug it all in. <laughs> Strings are old on it. I have used it live a few times. It's got a built-in tuner on it. It's actually got some power in the battery. I like it's in tune so though. Does all that stuff. A bit of a cutaway so you can get up the dusty end. Um, so that's me, my face, Venus, naked. Naked because it's uh, satin finish, there's no there's no uh, gloss finish on the front, it's just all s complete satin, spruce. Um, not the cheapest, but like I say, you know, they're a lifelong thing. I think my, old, my oldest one is in the loft, you know, I mean, that must be, it's, it's over 30 years. Um, I had that. In here, my oldest one is probably 93, I think, so like 94, around then. Uh, took that out of the way. Um, get these two. These these two are fairly modern. Uh, you might have seen them if, if you've watched any of my videos. This is my popular go-to gigging one. It cost an absolute bomb. Uh, bought it in probably 2020. That's my uh, Les Paul standard Gibson. Um, obviously, it's all electric plug-in job. Select switch, two pickups, two volumes, two tones, chunky neck, all right, 
a hefty thing. It makes me backache when you're still doing a show for like, you know, two hours. Um, love the guitar, you know. Can be a bugger to stay in tune with the, the G string, but um, nice guitar. And I always wanted one, you know, a Les Paul. So when I had the opportunity and the money to buy one, um, I got one. But they hold the value well, so if I get to a point where I'm really skint, I'll have to uh, be probably one of the first ones I'll have to say goodbye to. Um, you know, because they're not, uh, not hundreds of pounds, that it's uh, a couple of thousand. That's right, dear. This next one's uh, quite a special one. This was a this was a present from my, my partner, Jill. Um, I've not used it live yet, to be honest. Um, I'll probably take it out for its run next year. Um, this is a PRS S2 McCarty. 594. Um, I think it appeared in the band's Jesus of Suburbia video. Um, love the guitar. Similar sort of, you know, it's got the uh, two volumes, two tones. It's got a coil split on it as well. Three way selector. Cut away for the dusty end stuff. Plays nice. A lot lighter. You know, they do the, the core version, which has got a nice, you know, um, I can't record now. Um, the, the top's more curved and everything and um, it's obviously hours of craft and time carving so it's the same hardware as a core and probably for about um, 1500 quid less but yeah lovely guitar nice color sometimes you get put off by pure black but um, this is it's supposed to be an elephant gray this but but yeah it's a nice guitar you know and uh, spend the money on the case as well it's looked after then what have we got next? Uh, a fairly recent GP purchase. Uh, right, it's a bit of a steal to be honest. This is a, an Epiphone Les Paul Junior. Um, it'll it'll probably be my Frankenstein guitar. This I will end up modifying it at some point. I'll put a new pickup in it, new um, saddle pots and a, a nut on it. But for now, it's just my go-to sort of. I can grab it off the wall, you know. Uh, all I did was I brought it back, polished it, and put some new strings on it. Uh, I've not actually used it full flat yet, but uh, strings are out of tune on it, but. Uh, Still settling in a bit. Yeah, so that's the uh, that's Paul Junior Epiphone. So uh, it's just Epiphone's like a cheaper range of Gibson, really. Nice, simple use. One pickup, one volume, one one tone. I'll probably end up putting a P90. If those who know about pickups, probably end up putting a P90 in this. I quite fan. I, I don't have a P90 or anything, but uh, it's all black. Some some guitars you see, it'll be you'll get a pattern front and they're just all black on the back, you know. That's nice when you get that flame effect, but uh, for Les Paul Jr., you know, don't mind it at all. Good guitar. Uh, this one here, I've had a few years. Stunning looking guitar. I think in the video we did for Captain, um, I used this. I've recorded quite a bit on this one too. This is me. Uh, Chapman, lovely colour. It's like a tele Telecaster style body. Um, a lot chunkier than that. It's got basically a selector switch here, which is kind of like um, you've got your pickups. You can have like the back one, middle, or front, and then it basically it, it kind of coil taps on the in between. Single volume and tone, 24 frets, really good access to the neck. Lovely chamfer out there. The thing is, it's quite unbalanced. I find it's because it's quite heavy and long at that end. On the strap, when you let go, it tends to want to go down like that. But absolutely, you know, can't really tell on this line. It's a stunning finish. Nice guitar. Uh, not use this one live either, to be honest. Um, might have done, I can't remember now. But uh, not mega expensive. Real bang for your buck, that one. But uh, like I say, when I got it, I had to get a a bass guitar case because it's, it's long, you know, and you, cases can be like 100 quid. 
you know, but it's looking after something for a lifetime in there. And Kane's little tortoise table is, uh, was designed and built so I could fit guitar cases right underneath it. I'm opening these, I'm not actually sure what's in them. Plenty of dust on them anyway. What's this one? Huh. Right, oh, this one's not been out for a bit. This is my Fender Telecaster. Uh, standard, you know, it's, it's USA made. So it's the, um, it's everything standard. It's got brass saddles on it and that. Single pickups, three-way selector, volume tone. The thing is with Telecasters, they're, a, they're quite a bright sound when you plug them in. So you roll the tone back a bit, you know. Um, probably I'll be crackly now, but I'll have to uh, get them all out, get them cleaned and see what's working before I sort of go out on the gigs next year. Um, because I tend to use a different ones when I'm recording something. Um, I'll record different parts or I'll record the same part on different guitars. So when you actually do the mix, it sounds a lot bigger. And that's something you can't do live, obviously, but for recording purposes, you'll go out, I'll, I'll play that chorus once with that guitar and then I'll play it again with that. So you're doubling up. And it's just that slight difference between guitars. It just it doesn't make it louder. It just makes it sound like more. So that's me, Fender Telecaster. Um, not mega dear. I'd probably say this is kind of like the mid mid price ones. But uh, got a few to go at yet. This one um, <coughs> I bought. To try and force me to start playing again because I gave up bands sort of like 2002. I'd had enough, you know, of all the falling out and moaning and groaning and people letting you down so i didn't play anything for about seven years i just packed my stuff away i thought stuff it i'm not doing it again you know i got angry at it i hated music so i don't even listen to music because i know it won't it make me want to go out and do it again so i ended up going and buying this 2009 uh similar to some of my older ones really um, but this is a jackson completely different style to the other ones it has a you know a whammy bar all that in so you can do all the uh you probably won't hear that that well but uh love the guitar i have used this live um only once but i uh it, i can't it's hard to, it's i mean the, it's still, the maple's still fairly light on it because some of my guitars are like yellowed but just to age i mean the white's not as white probably do with the polish to be honest um fretboard's filthy strings are absolutely rusted to heck little chip on the pickup there but um it's still a really stunning guitar in white you know the, the, having the maple neck on it the volume tone three-way selector so you could have either that both or the front but uh only thing is it's locking trim so it stays in tune but if a string snaps you're knackered because that the spring tension at the back it'll pull them back so you have to kind of uh, stop and then put a new string on where well, some of the older ones with the uh, the floyd roll system i um blocked them so they couldn't go back not ideal the point of having a floyd if you're going to do that next up we have uh This is a PRS, I think. Yep, it's another PRS. This is a PRS um, Bernie Marsden. I think Bernie Marsden passed away sadly this year. He used to be a guitarist for Whitesnake, I think. Um, you know, he's a British guy. This is based sort of off his The Beast, I think. And I've, 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 I've this was my, this was my go-to live guitar for quite a few uh, years until I got my Les Paul. Um, but I need to get this back out next year. It's got a nice low action on it and everything. Um, Three-way selector. You've got um, two volumes and one tone. But um, needs some new strings, a bit of a clean up, a bit of TLC. And it'll be uh, up to the goods again. But cracking guitar. We'll wrap around bridge and that. Not dead heavy. Neck's still nice and fairly chunky, but not, not ridiculously chunky. But uh, 
Gorgeous guitar. I've got it second hand. I think I got it about 2015. I think I bought that. Back when I had some money. But yeah, I'd got it in the shop looking for something completely different that day, and I spotted it, and it was obviously second hand. You know, a lot of my guitars are second hand. You know, because if you, you've not played on them, you buy one, you might not like them. It's always a good jump. If you know somebody who's got one, play on it. I've no idea what this is. Going back in history now. Uh, now this one, I bought look at that skull and crossbow strap, really old. Uh, it's a Dean. Um, and I bought this probably in 1994. This one, I think. Second hand for about um, 120 quid, I think it was back then. Um, I have used this live quite a few times. Um, my Deans were my main live staple back in back in day a bit. I used to do like open mic nights and get up and jam and whatnot, and you know messing about with the other bands and stuff. But it was just, it, it wasn't, it was a bit different back then. It was more of a DOS. I mean, it's got chips on it and all sorts. I've got some black paint, I should have to fill it in. But this this should be near enough white, this, but it's just what maple does. It goes out sort of nice and yellowing sort of as it ages. Like I say, you know, I mean, it's nearly 30 years I've had that guitar. Um, you know, and when I pick it up and play it, It'll, it'll feel familiar because my body will just remember it because it's worn to me um, and it has a lot of memories these old instruments you look at them it takes you back to a time when you used them and uh, it was fun it was great fun you know back then um, young skint I mean, what it to do was be in a band and no responsibilities, I have to worry about anything. Um, let's have a look what I've got next. Well, there's not many left now, there's only this one and one more. What's this? Oh, this, yeah, this was my first proper guitar, this one. Uh, I, I have a special bond with this. Um, it just, I don't know, whenever I pick it up, it just, I don't know, something about it. I just, I miss using it. It's not the easiest to play. You know, this is the one where it's all blocked at the back, inside there. But it has a... Something about it, it just, it, it, because I, I did the bulk of my learning on this, to be honest. I had my cheap guitars, and then this was my first proper guitar, about 350 quid back in 1990. 394 possibly um, and I've played the hell out of it you know the frets are quite flat I'm surprised I don't need refretting to be honest I've played the absolute hell out of it you know it, it, this I'd never let go of this never yeah I do I just have a bit of a special bomb with this one the hours spent on it the yeah, absolutely thousands of hours you know, when I used to play back in the day, it was, you know, five, six hours a day without fail. You know, get home from college, plug in, play till the neighbours moaned. <laughs> but uh, yeah, some great memories with that guitar. Uh, I think the last time I used it, I think I got it out, I took it to a rehearsal, probably about 2018. I think the last time I played on that one. Uh, And this last one was a bit of a special one, really. Uh, not, not used it live. Um, but it's in a really old case, as you can tell. I'll move the camera, I must have caught it before, but still see. Um, it was a bit of a, an old knacker thing that was in the corner at shop. It was 70 quid. But it's worth a lot more. Um, <clears throat> this is a, an Ibanez Deluxe 59 model, which dates back to 1977, I think it is. 
um, Kane's having a stomp about. Um, it's, it's all original. The only thing I've changed, I put I had a switch pot in it the other year. And it all cleaned up the pots and that. It's tatty, it's full of chips. But 19, 1977, the year after I was born, that. It still works fine. You know, and it's, it's not as heavy as a Les Paul. It does that Les Paul thing, you know. A little bit hotter on the pickups. Same thing, two pickups, two volumes, two tones. But this was part of the lawsuit because the Les Paul Gibson headstock was slightly different shape at the top. So they had to they had to alter. Well, they had to change it to this one because it was too close. There's a big lawsuit if you read like in the 70s between Gibson and Ibanez. So this one was post. It wasn't prior to it, otherwise it'd have like the, uh, the Les Paul head. The specs are pretty much exactly the same. If you, you put them side by side, Everything's the same apart from that headstock, really. Obviously, the weight because it's, it's got a it's not a hollow, but it's got a good resonant sound. That it's, it's naturally loud without being plugged in. But like I said, the pickups are quite hot on it. You, you can um, you can do some pretty angry guitar work on that. Right, so that's all my guitars. Um, so I think the last question was to do with mixers. So uh, I'll have a, another brew and we'll uh, we'll wrap up with that one. It's going to be a horrendously long video, this. So I don't know how many are still watching till now. But if you are, give us a thumbs up and a, a like and that. Right, we're almost at the end of the video now. So it's been, like I said, it's going to be a massive video. I don't know how long it's going to be in total. I've been doing it in snippets. So the uh, last question was to do with um, the actual, uh, do I use a mixer? or do I use the pub sound or the, the venues in house? A lot of venues don't have their own system in house or in, you know, they don't supply it. So you either have to hire or buy your own. Um, so I own the band's um, sound system, the speakers. I'm not going to bring the speakers in because they're massive. <coughs> I'm even out of puff carrying this thing because this is quite heavy. Um, the speakers I use are Yamaha DXRs. 15 inch and the subwoofer is a um, Yamaha DXS 18 um, just the one subwoofer I do have the floor wedges or the angled speakers that go on the floor which are called floor monitors and also in-ear monitoring which I'll show you where that goes in because I think it was Christine that said about uh, a sun played bass and had tinnitus so in-ears well, in a monitoring will greatly help. So, uh, I have to probably might have to do this handheld, I think. I don't know. Um, but basically, in ear monitors, you can have molds done to your ears if you want to leave slot in. But uh, I'll just put one in so you can see. Right, so, your, your in ear monitoring system is basically um, get a set of these. Like, Headphones. You can get these things all much like I said, you can get them moulded. And they basically, I, I took it down my t-shirt. So you've got all this preparation and messing about to do while you're gigging. So there's a million things to think of. So it's, uh, you are under a lot of pressure when you're doing something live. You got, these are Shure, um, Shure CL425, so these are. Um, not cheap, but um, I need a little, because I'm hard of hearing, I need a little bit of low end in there just to help keep me in tune. Um, obviously we're singing and obviously we're playing. Little tiny dot on which is uh, left and right. So you basically goes down the back of your t shirt, and then you've got like memory foam squidgy things on these. Make sure I've got them the right way around. Nope. And then uh, they, they kind of, there is a knack, they, they come straight, you have to bend them like this. So you basically uh, squeeze that end in, shove it over your ear, in your ear. It's tucked out the way like that. And when you've got that in, you can't hear anything because they're like putting your fingers in your ears, you can't hear nothing. So you have them on, and then they took, like I say, I took it down the back of my t shirt, and then uh, that plugs into a little little system that I've had a couple of years now, um, which is uh, this. And you get this bit, that bit goes in your mixer. Your headphones plug into this little box, 
a five hour charge in it. I've no affiliation with any of this music here at all, so I'm not making anything on this. Um, little off on switch so it lights up, little um, channel so you can select what channel you want because obviously, I guess, well, in our case, three of us use these, so you don't want to be on the same channel because you're all hearing a different thing. And a little volume controller as well. So that's wireless, so this connects to that. Um, that's the X5 U4 receiver. Um, and then you obviously get the transmitter, which if your mixer is XLR, you know, that is um, female. And then you can get, a, if you've got a, a jack on your mixer, these go into the auxiliary, not the headphone out, the auxiliary out. Um, just plunk it together and you've got your whole thing. And you'll find your auxiliary channel. Well, when I'm playing live, I'm auxiliary one. Um, Slot that in there, and then that'll transmit to my headphones, and I'm off out of the way doing the stage thing. So I'll move the camera and let you have a look at the mixer a bit more. All right, I'm going to do this uh, sort of free hand holding camera, so it might get a bit wobbly because I'm going to try and look what I'm doing. Like I say, me, me and ears go through into auxiliary one. So basically, I've got obviously the instruments down here, I've got you know, um, Adam who's a bass player, me, Mike, there are microphones. Nothing there, because um, it was Ben, he's gone now, Ben. Um, so we need to put uh, the new guy's name, which is Steve on. And we've got the uh, bass, which is the bass player. My left and right guitar signal, Mike's guitar left and right. This is drum kit, so you've got kick, snare, floor tom. Um, that's another tom, or toms, and you've got all red microphones. So these all get sent to here, which go either via a group. It's like all the drums are set, sent to a group. Instead of like trying to move them all up and down, sent there, and that sends it to there. That goes off, um, goes through an EQ and a compressor, then it goes to the speakers. These are just like panning dials, so you pan a bit left and right. Um, this is like effect, you want a little bit of echo on. All this stuff is your EQ. So your microphone or your guitar instrument goes in. You bring up your, well, you've got a limiter. You can bring your trim or your gain up to you getting a good signal. Because ideally you want to be bringing your signal in, so this is lighting up to green at zero, which is unity. And then you've got your your high, and you've got your high mid, so this is like a sweepable thing, so you'll find your frequency, and then you'll cut it, whatever, you know, it'll only cut a certain area of the frequency, so it won't turn everything down, it'll just turn a specific area of the frequency down. The upper mids, low mids, low. These are the auxiliaries, so anything to do with in-ear monitoring or floor wedge monitoring, it goes through the auxiliaries. So I'm auxiliary one, so everything along here is, I just hear that, that's what goes to my ears. So, like I say, I want to hear some of my vocals, I want to hear some, some of the other vocals as well. And then obviously, these are off at the moment. I've got guitar, well bass, my guitar, Mike's guitar. Sometimes a bit of drums, you know, it depends if it's a live kit or an electric kit. And that just goes to me. So if I wanted to, you know, hear more of my own vocals, I'd just go to here, turn that up. That would turn just my microphone, my vocals up in my ears. No one else's. It won't affect what's going to the front of the house. Because this is before that. This is what gets sent to the front of the house. But channel mutes. When you're setting your actual incoming signal, this is a pre-fader. So it tells you it's input signal before it comes to this fader. And then when you then afterwards, it, that light that light that comes up on, on here will tell you where else it's going after that. Um, these go out, obviously these go out to the EQ and then the, the channel thing. So um, yeah, Soundcraft, MTK. Um, I can multi-track with it. So when I've done a gig, I can call it back through a laptop and remix it or listen to it when rehearsals you can listen back to it um and i can call it back and remix it and it's handy because you can find out where there's been any mistakes you think oh what was that mistake there and you can listen because you are your worst critic you, you should be your own worst critic and you should with you being a musician you'll hear a bit more than what the general public will so you become a bit critical when the public you know especially when they've had a few pints and a few sheets that win like they don't really bother but that's uh, that's the mix of the band uses um there is a few other little bits and bobs, but primarily it's like from us, either guitar, microphone, into this, which then sends it to our ears via this, or a floor wedge, which that'll plug into, so you can send it to, to a floor wedge and to your ears in case your ears go down, 
you can pull it out your ears and you've got a floor wedge you can hear from. And then um, then it obviously goes off to front of house to the audience. Um, cracky mixer. Uh, I used to use a Yamaha one. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all there is. Um, uh, you know, if there was an in house system in a pub, I would use that. I'd just have to look at it, I'd have 10 minutes looking at the mixer and figure it out, and then I'd use that. The other way, sometimes what we've done is we've sent our signal out from here left and right. It was like a resident DJ or something, and just send him two wires out of there, and he'll put them into his mixer, which is just two channels. And I'll just say to him, leave your set all, all at 12 o'clock. Um, just make sure the input gains are all right. Or if he's got like a, a line level input, <clears throat> which like this, you know, line level's a bit stronger than microphone. Um, then I can uh, just kind of go through his system, but I can still use my mixer for EQing because it's kind of familiar territory once you work your way around the mixer. So that's it for that one. So that's it for this video. Uh, it's been a big long one, um, but uh, there was no other way of doing it, to be honest. I thought, well, I thought I'll, I said I'd answer all these questions in as much detail as I can. And um, so, however, if it's an hour, two hours, I have no idea. I was going to put it all together and then I'll upload it. Um, and any questions you've got on this, put them in the comments below. And like I say, if, you, if you've enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. I don't mind doing this type of thing. If people are interested in it and they want to know anything about things I can do, I'm willing to share the knowledge because that's what YouTube is all about, sharing. You know, we all share to, you know, to learn from each other in all aspects of whatever we do. So uh, thanks for watching. Take care. Like I say, if you want to support the channel, there's a link in the description below how to do that. So, and maybe I might see some of you at a gig in the future. Um, I say, um, when I'm there, just, give a, you know, a hello and come and introduce yourself and that. Um, and then, uh, be performing live, so obviously I'm working, so don't get much chance for much chatting, but, um, yeah, we can have a little bit of a chat. So, uh, take care and I will see you again soon. See you now. Bye-bye.